from the beginning. And I was shown that, um, uh, that Lucifer would return, that the UN and the Vatican were going to be completely behind it, again, under false pretenses. He's going to show up and say, I'm here to save the day, right? And, okay, fine, you know. Yeah, of course, you can say whatever you want. I've always hated censorship. It's the internet. Sometimes, you know, once they get you for your first love bite, well, it depends on how aware you are, right? First of all, as you know, the, uh, the Anunnaki and the Draco are enemies. Second of all, underneath Baghdad was a stargate that was created by the Anunnaki so that they could transfer from the middle to the Earth. I'll never see the sun. I could just end it all, but the demons will have one. Practitioners that, you know, some are, are good and some use their magic for good and to heal and to help, and others do use it for evil. And, you know, in some cases, you know, people really were... <laughs> This is too much sometimes. From the broken ruins of Babylon, this is End of Days Radio. I'm your host, Daniel, talking to you all the way from that shimmering emerald city right here on the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Well, sort of. It's actually in an inlet. Right here in the heart of the Pacific Northwest, the date is... August 22nd, 2017. Today's guest, John L. Stedman, is a scholar of both H.P. Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft and Western occultism, and has been a magical practitioner for over 30 years, working with various covens and small groups of initiates. He's an author and has written some very interesting books that you can pick up off Amazon.com and several other places, I'm sure. Let's go ahead and see if we can get him on the line. Hello, John. Hi. How are you, Daniel? Hi. Doing good. Welcome to the end of days. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you are coming through loud and clear. Great. What I usually like to do to start things off is just ask, how are things going with you? Is there anything new in your world? Well, I'm uh, at the end of this month, you know, uh, starting on uh, Saturday and Sunday, I'm going down to Buffalo, New York. I'm going to be giving a presentation there, the uh, Carnival of Power Horror for 2017. And it's going to be a nice little animation presentation on uh, H.P. Lovecraft's cosmic horror and what i'm arguing in a presentation is that lovecraft's horror is uh much more horrifying and and terrible than anything the media or the contemporary cinema and literature can even conceive of and so that's what i'm going to talk to them about there i'm going to be giving that presentation on saturday and sunday there i'm also going to of course take my books down and do book signs and uh and visit with people that might want to stop by the table. So that's the main thing that's coming up right now. Sounds pretty cool. And how was it that you originally started to get into this stuff like H.P. Lovecraft and magic? Well, when I was a young kid, of course, I grew up uh, 
in uh, like the late 50s and the early 60s. And that was around the time of monsters, you know, monster magazines. I read famous monsters in uh, film land. And I used to like reading ghost stories. So when I was a little kid, I used to uh, read these kinds of things. And uh, then when I got into middle school, of course, my uh, taste in literature became a little bit more refined. I, I started to read people like Edgar Allan Poe. And Ray Bradbury, who's one of my favorite authors, M.R. James, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And uh, around that time in middle school, I also discovered Lovecraft. Now, back then, Lovecraft wasn't as popular as he became in the late 70s and the early 80s. But uh, I'd gone to a store and I saw this paperback book. It had like a, a orange kind of fiery skull on the cover and it had a black background. It was called like The Color Out of Space and Other Stories by H.P. Lovecraft. And I'd never heard of Lovecraft before, but I figured that any book that had a cover like that would have to be really good, you know. So I picked up a copy and then I started reading the stories and then I got hooked on Lovecraft. And then after that, I just became a complete fan. And then when I went to high school, I got into magic and occultism. And um, I started performing Western magic. And then over the years, as I kind of refined my magical practice going into college, I started to realize that the Lovecraftian entities were just perfect for magical rituals and magical activities. So it was kind of an evolution from horror, fantasy, science fiction from my youth to magic in uh, high school and then to uh, eventually blending the two into my own form of magical system. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, the evolution. It's funny that you brought up Ray Bradbury. Wasn't he the guy that wrote that book, Something Wicked This Way Comes? Yes, he did. He did. That's one, one of, of my Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. One of my favorites of all time. Yeah, I've got a new book that I just turned over to my publishers, and what I'm doing is I'm making an argument, and this one they might not go for because it's more like literary criticism than magic. It's called H.P. Lovecraft's Magical Persona and the Cthulhu Mythos, and what I do in the book, in the first section, I argue that Lovecraft created uh, a character called the Magical Persona in his great works, and that's based on his uh, inspiration from Edgar Allan Poe, Hawthorne, and M.R. James, and in that book, I, I give a really complete interpretation of Lovecraft's stories with magical personas after I established the connection between Lovecraft and the other, the other authorities. And I've read everything. I've read all the experts, all the critics, everything. And so I give kind of definitive interpretations of those stories. And then I argue in the third part of the book that Lovecraft's magical persona was picked up on by other writers in the Cthulhu mythos right up to the present time. And you were mentioning Bradbury. I've got an appendix chapter where I show how heavily influenced Ray Bradbury was by H.P. Lovecraft's works. And it's like a pretty long uh, appendix. It's like about 30 pages long. So I, I argue in that that Lovecraft actually uh, was very inspirational to Bradbury himself. A lot of people don't realize that, but I think I make a good case for it in that book. Did Lovecraft's work scare you at first, or does it still? I'll tell you something, you know, when I grew up reading all these horror things, I uh, kind of became desensitized a little bit. And I used to think, like back when I was in middle school, that there really was no such thing as a story that could scare me. The only story that could really scare me back then was uh, The Room in the Tower by uh, E.F. Benson. I don't know if you've read that one or not, but it's a really scary vampire story. But uh, that book that I got, the one with the uh, orange skull on the cover, uh, on that day that I got the book, I was reading it out on a nice autumn day, and it was bright bright daylight, you know, sunlight. I was reading it at the schoolyard, and I read the title story, The Color Out of Space, and it sent chills up and down my spine. And, you know, I thought that wasn't possible for somebody of my jaded temperament and inclinations, you know, but uh, Lovecraft very definitely did scare me, and so that was part of the attraction for him, too, because he did something that a lot of the more conventional the horror stories just couldn't do. I mean, think about your conventional horror stories for me. I mean, they're still doing them. Like, look at the films that they have out, like the vampire movies, Twilight, the werewolf kind of themes and stuff. It hasn't changed much in a hundred years. You know, they're still the kind of same tired kind of, and zombies, the same kind of tired formula, human-centric kind of monsters. And uh, those kind of things never really scared me that much, but they're still doing all the things. Part of when I go down to the carnival, part of horror, I'm going to explain exactly what the 
lack of horror is about these things and why Lovecraft stuff is even more terrifying. But Lovecraft is a master of his craft, and he's never been equal today. You know, I mean, they're still doing these tired formulas. But Lovecraft, he died in uh, in 1947, and he's still he's still uh, got more effect than a lot of the writers that are writing today. So, I guess I answered your question in a kind of roundabout way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing that I notice when reading Lovecraft stories is I, I tend to get a little bit of a, I, I don't know if I would call it a chill down my spine. It's more of just a creeped out feeling like there are things out there that are massively terrifying and things that I probably shouldn't know about. Uh, and my question is, does Lovecraft's work possibly have some kind of effect on consciousness? Uh, well, you can uh, use them in magical rituals, you know, so I suppose you could say it has an effect on consciousness. But the thing about Lovecraft is that his, his entities and his situations are just unlike any other kind. You said that you felt an uneasy sensation. Well, Lovecraft is a master of creating that kind of uneasy sen- sensation. His entities are l- totally in alignment with the quantum physics view of the world, which is very terrifying when you think about it. They, don't, they believe that there's nothing there. The cosmos is just nothingness. The universe was kind of like a quantum effect, and it will end. We have the Big Bang, and then we're going to have the Big Crunch, and that mankind's existence is very tenuous, and it's very short-lived. And the, uh, the cosmos and these entities, they talk about them as being gods or goddesses, but they're really not. They're just entities that are in either alternate dimensions or outside of our time-space continuum. And their connection to us is the same kind of connection we have to like if we're walking down the street and we step on an ant. We don't even notice we've done it. You know, we're not even conscious of the fact that an ant, and the ant itself doesn't know what happened to him. There's just some kind of crazy thing that happened that came out of nowhere and stamped out its life. And it has, it can't even see or understand fully what's going on. And Lovecraft claims that the outer forces, which you can personify as his great old ones, are like that in relation to us. They have, they're completely indifferent to us. They don't even know we're here a lot of times. They can't conceive of us. They're totally, it's not that they're evil or they're malignant against us. They just don't care. I mean, I can't say that I step on an ant because I'm trying to be evil or malignant to the ant. I'm trying to stamp it out. I don't even see that it's there. It's that insignificant. Well, Lovecraft's view of the cosmos and of these entities is that kind of a view, and that's what makes people uneasy because they realize that the human being is not the center of cosmos. It's a strange little accidental phenomenon, and it's not going to last very long in the uh, history of time. And so that's where the uneasiness comes from. You look up at the sky and the cosmos and you realize that you're not that important and that there's no gods up there that are trying to protect you or trying to uh, are interested in your welfare or your evolution. So I, I guess that's the uneasiness that you're talking about. I'm a little bit of a, a comic book nerd. And, and one thing that I've noticed is a particular comic book it called Doctor Strange. They recently made a movie about it, but that whole story and the things that happened, they, it seems like that comic book is very inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, you could view it that way. Now, I used to love Doctor Strange. Like back when I was growing up reading Famous Monsters, I was also reading Marvel comic books. That was the age, the 60s was the age of the golden age of Marvel comics. And I used to read all of them. I liked Doctor Strange. In fact, I collected a lot of the Doctor Strange ones. And they kind of create a cosmos there too. And I, I suppose you could say that they're a little bit inspired by Lovecraft because you've got these outer forces. But you can see the flaws in, in, uh, in the Doctor Strange, especially the movie too. I saw the movie. Now, I, I always am a sucker for these kind of movies because Doctor Strange is a magical practitioner, right? So this is what I am, you know. So I, of course, I'm going to like a movie like that and stuff. But it's very human centric when you think about it. like the human beings are trying to protect humans, and then you'll notice that when you're talking about Dormammu in the outer dimensions, you know, supposedly that's beyond our space and time. But Dormammu himself is very human centric too. He's like a big head. You don't see all of them. Now, in the comic books, he was very human-centric. He had that kind of yellowish flame and red kind of burning head, you know, but then he had a human body, too, you know. So they're very human-centric. And when you think about, like, Dorman Muse trying to break into our part of the cosmos, kind of like to dominate us, and they do get a sense a little bit of 
like how insignificant humans are. You notice at the end of the movie when they actually merge with Dormammu, that Mordor and his two assistants, they actually get fried basically and they get sucked into – and there's no personal immortality. I mean they're just sucked into kind of a wholeness. But still, those movies are very human-centric still. Uh, in Lovecraft's universe, the entities are like almost like cosmic – or quantum events there's nothing human centric about them. and they're not malignantly trying to do anything you know they're just acting on their own purposes which we can't even understand or even comprehend and they're not malignant to us they're not trying to dominate or overthrow us you know they don't care anything about us at all so it kind of hits some of the cosmicism but yet it also does a concession to the human centric like the Avengers movies for instance remember the Avengers number one movies where you had invaders coming in through a hole in the dimensions and that's very human centric again the, the entities themselves had the human form and so it's like invaders trying to uh, overthrow the uh, humans and they're kind of very similar to us they might look a little bit more lizard like and stuff but they have the same kind of, uh, the same kind of shape and designs that we have, you know. So Lovecraft goes a lot farther than that. But I would agree with you that it does kind of approach a little bit closer to Lovecraft than a lot of the mo- uh, the modern movies of just alien invasions do. Yeah, there's one character that is in the comics, but he's not in the movies, or at least not in the movies yet. And his name's Shumagorath, and he's very similar to some of Lovecraft's descriptions. Yeah, well, that one, like, I got off the uh, Marvel comic trains, like, around the same time that Steve Ditko stopped illustrating Doctor Strange in the Marvel years. So I don't remember that particular character. It probably came after that, you know, but I didn't keep up on the comic books after that, you know. So as far back as I can remember, Dormammu was still, they had one thing where Dormammu had teamed up with Mordor and he was giving him power so he could defeat Doctor Strange, and Doctor Strange won anyhow, and that's the last comic that it was a whole series, like it went through a whole series. We, that was when Doctor Strange w- shared the comic with Iron Man. Remember that it was called Tales of Suspense or something. And I got off the train after that, you know. So this character you're talking about, I've never heard of. But you're saying that this character is a little bit less human centric and more like the amorphous kind of quantum kind of entities that we find in Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, at some point, I'm not sure when exactly it happened, but they introduced the concept of uh, I can only imagine that they were increasingly being being inspired by Lovecraft stuff and, and the popularity around the mythos, but they introduced this concept of the many angled ones, this other dimension yeah. full of just strange alien beings, and, and one of the most powerful ones is Shumagorath, and he's always trying to get into this dimension and take it over. And uh, another thing that I, f- I love about the Doctor Strange thing, and this was in the movie was the fact that he's actually a magical genius and anything that he looks at it's like he learns right away he he doesn't need to sit there and study something or memorize it he just knows it right away i think that's something that's really cool and, and the other thing about that movie that i really liked was that that some of the things uh, you know as somebody that has an interest in magic it seemed like a lot of the stuff obviously it was fake but a lot of it was true actually there there are really occult laws being talked about in that movie yeah, well, the the things that I liked about was that Doctor Strange definitely seemed to have an intuition for it. Uh, the things I find less uh, enchanting is when they they uh, put the human things when they try and impose human the limited human perceptions of things onto more cosmic things. Like, you'll notice Doctor Strange was able to overcome Dormammu by actually getting him hooked in this kind of time loop. Now, an entity like Dormammu. Uh, is beyond time. He's beyond time. That won't work for an entity that's beyond time. Now, Dormammu could not be beyond space because he's part of the universe, you know. Uh, but he, he certainly was beyond time. And so uh, I don't believe that Doctor Strange could have actually manipulated time and, and caught him in a warm. I mean, it makes a good story, certainly, and everything. I like it when we have a good happy ending and stuff. But they what they were doing was kind of imposing a human view on something that's out in the universe. And this is something that Lovecraft just has no truck with. You know, uh, his entities are sometimes alien entities in the universe, and then they're free 
to an extent from time, from our views of time, but not necessarily space, because everything in the universe is still part of the space. Sometimes these entities are in different dimensions, and they can go from dimension to other dimensions. But Lovecraft is very careful to make us aware. And if you read his stories, you'll see that he makes us very aware that we can't really understand what these entities are. Our per- human perceptions are so limited and so flawed that we cannot even conceive of what we're seeing. And what we do, the mind does what it does when it can't understand something. It just grabs things that it can understand, and then it throws it at what it's seeing in an effort to try and understand, but it's just distorting what's actually there. Did you ever read the story, The Call of Cthulhu? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just about to ask you a question about that. You know, one thing that I always have trouble with is the pronunciation. And some people say Clatulu and some people just say Clathulu. So I was wondering maybe before you say what you're about to say, if you could clear up that pronunciation thing for us. Okay, well, Lovecraft created these words because he wanted to kind of give trouble to the human vocal cords because we can not only not understand them, but we also can't even pronounce them. I pronounce it Cthulhu. Now, in a magical ritual, if I have occasion to use the word, you vibrate each letter of the word. That's how the magical effects take place with language and gestures. And so what you do is you break it down to phonetics, and then you vibrate those words. And it's too complicated to get into the topic of how you do the magic right now. In Chapter 1 of my book, I explain exactly how I'll do that so the reader can kind of understand what I'm talking about later on in the book. But uh, uh, I pronounce it Cthulhu. And I pr- I've heard it pronounced any number of ways, and they're all fine, you know, because they're all approximations to something that human beings can't really pronounce. But if you read that story very closely, most people get a mental image of Cthulhu, and it's like a big dragon-like thing, right? This immense thing with wings and claws, tentacles for faces, and that's how it appears in popular culture. If you see, like, artistic renditions of Cthulhu, and a lot of the mythos fictions being written now, they'll portray it as like some big monstrous kind of dragon-like thing green colored usually but if you read the story what's interesting about lovecraft here is cthulhu appears near the end of the story and he comes out the city of ryleth rises from the pacific ocean and there's an unfortunate group of uh, of mariners that actually land on ryleth and then cthulhu comes out and what's interesting here is that they're all destroyed except for one person now some of the ones who are destroyed They see it as like the way that I just described, as a gigantic thing with like the dragon kind of wings, the face of the tentacles, the claws, and you're kind of swept up by the claws, right? Some of them see it that way. But if you read the description, it's really interesting because some of them don't see it that way. Like one of the people, his mind cannot process what he's seeing at all. All he can think about is a mountain, a mountain walked or stumbled. That's all I can do. He sees this vast thing. He's not sure what it is. And he just describes it as a mountain moving, and that's the best he could do. Another person is actually being swallowed up. And here's how he describes it. I've got a copy of the book right here of the story. It says, Parker slipped as the other three were plunging friendly over endless vistas of green-crusted rock. Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute but behaved as if it was obtuse. Now, this particular person didn't see a dragon-like monster at all. He didn't see a mountain. He saw some weird geometrical thing happening, a a cute angle, which is a very small angle, behaving as though it's a very large angle, which makes absolutely no sense at all. So this person saw Cthulhu as some kind of strange geometrical effect. And what Lovecraft is trying to get at here is none of these things are really what Cthulhu is. It's... Things that our limited human perception seizes upon so we can interpret. Now think about that for a minute. This isn't a vampire or a werewolf or a zombie. These are all recognizable things that horror pictures do right now. This is a a creature, an entity, that we cannot even comprehend what it is. And yet somehow we're being consumed by it. Now that's pretty frightening. Yeah, and it almost reminds me... If someone was to take a psychedelic drug that they're just not prepared for at all and they end up seeing something that's so weird and alien, they can't even put it into words. Yeah, well, the Lovecraft does this constantly, and I always advise people just read Lovecraft because the interesting thing about him, he never repeats himself. A lot of these other fiction writers, they'll do the same thing over and over again, but each time you read Lovecraft, he's got a different story, 
different set of entities, different concerns, and it's always like he's approaching the same thing. The cosmic indifferentism, man's insignificance, and then the problems with perception, and then the quantum view, which is totally in accord with quantum physics right now, by the way. He approaches all these things in stories from a different standpoint, and he never repeats himself. It's always a little bit different. Sometimes they're viewed as gods or, or uh, dark entities. Sometimes they're viewed as aliens or extraterrestrial entities. And sometimes they're just like... Uh, Effects. They're like quantum effects. If you want to read one of the best stories that actually expresses the way that quantum physics views the universe right now, I'm not talking about quantum physics in the 1920s when it was just getting started, which Lovecraft was very familiar with. I'm talking about quantum physics right now with string theory and their theory of dimensions. If you want to see a story that actually expresses that right now, it's called The Dreams in the Witch House. It was actually written in 1932 by H.P. Lovecraft, and it's never been right by any writer since then but you get everything in Lovecraft and it's as fresh vibrant and as sophisticated magically and scientifically as it was back in the 20s and 30s when he wrote it was Lovecraft himself into the occult no he wasn't and part of the reason why I wrote my book H.P. Lovecraft and Black Magical Tradition is because I wanted to write a book because you hear a lot of things a lot of fans of Lovecraft and then other people think that he was an occultist. They'll have all these stories out there like he was connected with Aleister Crowley. Uh, Peter Levanda had a little view that somehow Lovecraft was chal- uh, channeling one of uh, Crowley's entities, A.I. was, through Cthulhu. A lot of crazy stories like that, that Lovecraft was a practicing magician or a Satanist. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to uh, clear up all those issues, and that's why I wrote this book. If you read this book, you'll find, you'll understand exactly how much and what Lovecraft knew about magic and Western occultism. And then you'll understand exactly how our stories work, what his entities are like. You'll understand all about the Necronomicrons, including the one, and none of them are true Necronomicrons, by the way. There is no such book. It's a fictional book. But I look at the spurious ones, the ones that are obvious fakes, and then I look at the Simon Necronomicron, which actually contains rituals that really do work, but I argue that that's a fake book too. And then after all these things are clarified, I study Lovecraft's influence on the black magical systems. And so every possible question you could have about whether Lovecraft was an occultist, what his influence is on magical systems right now, magical practice, and on modern science, it's all in this book. And I wrote it to clarify all those issues. So it's kind of like the definitive book on all these topics. So there was no Mad Arab in, in the Necromicon story that's purely fiction? It's all fiction. But there's nothing wrong with fiction. I've heard people criticize. They say, well, how can you use fictional entities? Because Lovecraft's entities were all fictional too. And they'll criticize. They say, how can you use those in, in magical rituals? But what I would argue is all entities, including you can make this argument about God himself, the, the God of the, of the Abraham, Jehovah. You can make an argument that all these entities at one time were fictional. And then what happened over time, they were created, uh, entities created in the form of man, God in the form of man's image. And then over time, they developed into powerful barriers of energy. And the reason why they have all the energy because people are feeding stuff in. Think about God for a moment, you know, and, and in 12, uh, in, uh, 1250 BCE, I think was around the time that Moses climbed up on Mount Sinai. There were a lot of gods and goddesses out there at that time. And he kind of brought it all together in the forms of the Ten Commandments and Jehovah. But think about it for a time. After that, in the New Testament, the uh, empty gained power. And all the power was put in there by people praying to the God, worshiping the God, say it by up churches and religions to the God and so it became a very powerful entity and they put all that energy in there and then you can take the energy out you can pray to it you can do rituals and then you'll get some of the energy back and so you could make the argument that all the gods the Greek gods the Hindu gods whatever are all just simply things that were start out as fictional entities and I'm arguing that you can use the Lovecraftian entities the way that you can use these other gods because they're no different really and in fact every time somebody writes a Cthulhu mythos story they put some more energy into whatever entity they're dealing with so you can use them uh, in a very creative not only creative artistically but also in a magical way now let me talk a little bit about fictional okay what's the difference between fictional and real there's a, a very thin line there don't you think 
Uh, yeah, you know, more and more doing this show, I'm starting to realize that uh, reality can be hard to uh, pinpoint sometimes. Yeah, well, remember, do you like the Harry Potter books? I love the Harry Potter books. Uh, I I'm, I was more into the movies. Yeah, well, the movies are kind of the same, but they have to kind of take out a lot of the stuff because she has a lot more stuff in those books. But I followed the same thing, and what I'm going to talk about now actually appears in that last movie. You know what, uh, Harry Potter. But there was a scene. If you remember the movie, then it's a scene just before he has his final battle with Lord Voldemort, and he goes into this kind of mystical, misty realm. And it's like King's Cross Station in London, but it's just filled with mist. And he meets Dumbledore. Now, remember, in the previous movie, Albus Dumbledore died. He was killed by uh, Malfoy and Professor Snape. And so, uh, in that one, he's dead. In the last book he's dead in the last movie he's dead but harry potter has a little exchange with him do you remember that scene in the mist just uh, before i, I have well, not watched the final movie yet but i am listening oh yeah well in the final movie and in the final book just before he has a final confrontation with lord voldemort harry potter is struck down by voldemort in the forest and he, voldemort thinks he's killed him but of course you can't kill harry potter so he's laying there, and he gets thrown into this kind of alternate dimension, and it's a misty kind of a dimension. He has a conversation with Dumbledore, and in the book and the movie, too, he kind of talks with Dumbledore, and he kind of clarifies what's been going on and how he can kind of finish off Voldemort finally. And then at the end of their conversation, uh, Harry Potter is actually getting ready to uh, wrap up the conversation. Al- Albus Dumbledore walks away, and then Harry Potter says to him, well, wait, wait a minute, sir. What's happening here, is this something that's happening inside my mind, or is it something that's really happening? Is it real? And Dumbledore turns to him, and he says, well, of course it's happening inside your mind, but does that mean it's not real? And I think that's a very important point here. Just because something's happening in your mind, like just because I conjure an entity in my mind, maybe I've created the entity myself. But just because I've done that, does that mean that it's not real and that it doesn't have real force and power? I would argue that it is real and it can be used magically in any other way, any other way you'd want to. I remember what you were saying uh, earlier caused me to remember something. I think the movie was called Clash of the Titans, but there was a oh, part yeah. where Zeus and Hera were having a discussion, and he was saying the exact same thing that you said. He was saying, we need these men, because if they're gone and they don't believe in us, we're not even going to exist. Yeah, a lot of writers have dealt with that theme. You know, they've argued that, you know, we've created them, and it's a symbiotic relationship, right? You know, I mean, uh, we need our gods to protect us and to pray for, and you know, they're very human-centric, a lot of our gods. Think about uh, the Jehovah, for instance, you always picture him as kind of like a Dumbledore figure, kind of white bearded. He's usually seen in profile, a white benign figure. And then he sent his only son to be embodied in human form. So our gods are still very human centric. The Greek gods are completely human centric. Look at Zeus and Hera. I mean, Zeus going around having sex with everything that moves on earth and Hera chasing after him, turning in the unfortunates into like fountains and echoes and stuff. You know, I mean, they're very human centric. All of our gods. Gods are, but when you think about it for a minute, uh, certain people need these gods kind of like as a crutch to make them feel less uncomfortable about that cosmos I was describing before, that pure nothingness of quantum physics is supposed. So we need the gods as a buffer to make us feel that something out there loves us and is protecting us. But you could view it symbiotically from the other standpoint too. They need us in order to exist. So it's a, uh, I don't know if it's quite a healthy relationship. But it is a relationship, and I think one cannot exist without the other. But Lovecraft's entities are way past that. He's an atheist, or he sometimes he seems like an agnostic, but he's an atheist. He moves us all way beyond that, and that's what's really kind of scary about Lovecraft because there's nobody out there watching over us, protecting us. Uh, bringing us to spiritual perfection in Lovecraft's universe, there is no such thing as spiritual perfection. We live here for a while. We're an aggregation of a bunch of energy streams. When we die, the energies disperse, and that's it. No personal immortality at all. And then eventually, our small time on Earth will be over. And then eventually, there will be a long period of time. Then the universe will be over. Everything gets sucked back into the Great Crunch. So it's a very pessimistic, gloomy view that kind of frightens a lot of people when they really think about uh, a lot of people don't like to think about it. now could there actually be a being like 
Cthulhu in the sense that there would be a powerful being that's able to reach out its influence and gain some sort of alignment or control or influence on an individual and somehow bring that person into into turning them into somebody that that worships the entity or or helps them gain more power is there some real phenomena like that well a magical practitioner that deals with these entities what they do is they view them as kind of like basically uh, a reservoir of information and experiences so when you do a ritual like to contact cthulhu you don't worship first of all we don't worship anybody but you do an, and you get what the experience of that kind of reality that alternate kind of reality is like and when you do the ritual you get kind of pulled into that kind of reality but it, it's not like the entity cares about you or that the entity's trying to turn you into like a denizen of him or or trying to direct you to become a follower to worship him or to set up an alternate religion, these entities are not concerned with human beings in that way. It'd be like an ant, uh, a magical practitioner, like an intelligent ant that's trying to understand a realm of reality that it's really not suited for but wants to understand it anyhow. And so it gets in there, and then the entity might be aware of it, but that doesn't mean the entity cares anything about You know, the entity doesn't really care about it. They just allow it. Uh, to actually do the explorations it wants for knowledge or power, and then the entity goes its own way. And so when you do magic, at least black magic, you're concerned with knowledge and power. You're just trying to gain more knowledge of what's out there, if you can. And uh, if you're a white magician, and I would argue the Catholic Church is a white magical organization, you're actually trying to spiritualize yourself, to protect yourself, and to evolve into something that's like God. But in Lovecraft's universe, there are no white magicians. Could one of these entities, whether real or whether a product of mass consciousness, could one of them possibly have been responsible for taking out the Mayan civilization? Well, you know, I, I, see, they, they don't want care. Why would they want to do that? Why would they be care, concerned about that? See, that's the thing is, you know, like, I don't believe that any of the entities that Lovecraft talks about would, would even be concerned about that. You know, they're not interested in human civilization any more than we're interested in anthills. You know, I, if we accidentally stamp on anthill, there's nothing malignant about it. We just didn't notice it. We don't care that much about it. And that's the way these entities are. Now, an alien, another race of aliens might be interested in doing that. But you have to understand in Lovecraft's things, there's a lot of different kinds of beings, but they're not all these kinds of entities that we're talking about. Like there are different races of people, of uh, aliens. And Lovecraft argues that these races that came here uh, – uh, billions of years ago, millions of years ago, before mankind even started to evolve, he claims that they actually sparked human evolution, but they didn't do it to actually kind of bring mankind to evolve. It was just kind of like a byproduct. They were kind of experimenting with single cells and then two cells, and then they were kind of uh, experimenting with evolution to see if they could uh, find to create things that they could use, perhaps, the way we'd use beasts of burdens, but then uh, they let it go. They weren't concerned about it. So these things are not concerned about man. There isn't one entity in Lovecraft's stories that would actually say, I need to wipe out a civilization because they don't. Not only are they not conscious of it, but they they usually wouldn't care if they were conscious of it. You know. So did so, you read somewhere somebody argued that the one of the great old ones uh, destroyed Mayan civilization? I've never heard that before. Yeah, um, I think that it's one of those things where it's just a great mystery. Nobody really knows what happens. Like, there was an early colony in the United States that disappeared just off the face of the earth. And uh, rather than take a simple Occam's razor answer, like it was Native Americans or starvation or disease, it's, I guess it's a little bit more fun to think that some sort of entity swallowed them up. Well, it's kind of fun, but do you see what you're doing when you say something like that? Yeah, you're kind of gratifying the human century. If you're arguing that the, the, uh, an entity that's beyond our time, not beyond our space necessarily, although Azathoth, and you could argue that uh, Nyarlathotep and yogg Sothoth to a certain extent are beyond space too because they're right, right at the crux of the Big Bang before the universe got created. And so these type of entities are in such a, a thing where they're not they're, – they're outside of our time and space entirely. So they won't care anything about Mayan civilization. But uh, other things – 
other types of beings like there are the Innsmouth characters in Lovecraft and there are different alien races that came from actual extraterrestrial worlds inside the Lovecraft universe. They might have done something like that, but you're falling into the fallacy when you say that of uh, imposing the human centric. What you're saying is that the entities want to destroy our culture for some reason. Maybe they were malignant or whatever, but that presupposes two things. One, it presupposes they care enough about human beings. Human beings are significant enough to them to actually want to destroy them. And then you'd have to accept the opposite argument too. That there are certain entities that would love human beings and want to protect them. And then you're back to good versus evil again. And the whole good versus evil thing. Good gods, bad gods, uh, gods, demons, things like that. That's all human-centric based on our own self-importance, our own view that we're at the center of cosmos. And that the cosmos... Is like us, you know, that the cosmos is at war, like the Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, and we have to be good, and there are good gods. The bad people, there are evil people, there are evil gods. So we're projecting that all out into the cosmos, and we're projecting our own human beliefs, our own human views, and our own human perfections on a canvas that really can't accommodate. So you see the fallacy. That's a fallacy that uh, sees Christianity for a long time. They talk about a good God. If they're going to have their good God and their perfection, then they have to have their evil too. There's no way around it. If you believe in good, you have to believe in evil. And then you're caught up in this endless round. The endless round of samsara, the Buddhist call, where you're constantly in the realm of desire and you have to break free of that wheel in order to find out what's really there. And what's really there is beyond space and time. Yeah, I I have heard things and, and they very, very well might be things that were made up by individuals who are attention seekers, who knows? But I like that. I like that kind of stuff. I'd rather talk to a person about conspiracy theories. Uh, I don't care what they talk about. They have all sorts of theories. You heard all these these things about alien astronauts, right? Eric von Daniken, the Chariot of the Gods. You know, Robert Temple talks about like uh, they have the doggone people, and supposedly they had information about the the double star series in the sky, and they learn that through alien technology. So you hear all this stuff all the time, right? And I love that kind of crap. I really do. I'd rather talk to a person that believes in this stuff and they can talk intelligently about. It. I'd rather talk to them for an hour than I would like to talk to like a business major that can't see anything beyond their nose for 10 minutes. You know, So I love these kind of conspiracy theories. I love these kind of talks. But let's face it, you know, evidence, you know, like uh, the Mayan civilization, it disappeared. You hear about other cultures suddenly disappearing. Well, yeah, you know, everything's possible, right? It's possible that uh, some entity did it, but it's also more probable that – other things happened, you know, like natural forces or other col- other races or cultures intervened or whatever. You know, there are a multitude of explanations here, probably a little bit more likely. But God bless those people. And I use the term God it, it, the way the Christians would in this particular instance. God bless people who see it as being the great old ones destroying the civilization. God bless them for believing that way. I love that kind of talk. Yeah, I I often I'll hear stories of, oh, I was abducted by the the reptilians or I was abducted by the mantis beings. And one thing that you do hear over and over is that these beings, we can't really grasp why they're here or what they possibly want with us because whatever it is, it's it's it has to do with them. They're they're another level up than us, and whatever intentions or whatever experiments that they're doing, it's just kind of beyond our understanding, and it's not a question of good or evil. It's a question of having a particular agenda. Yeah, well, people have argued that what that is is kind of like a hysterical kind of thing where people feel like a certain amount of angst, and in order to kind of make themselves feel more important, they feel like they've been abducted and experienced been on, and that validates them. That makes them important. You know, I'm important enough to be uh, experimented on by aliens. But let's think about it from a logical standpoint, okay? And this is what I like to do with Lovecraft too, because Lovecraft he created all these things, and that was kind of like the dark side of Lovecraft. But the light side of Lovecraft was he was an atheist, a scientific reasoner, and he didn't believe in gods or gods. So he had this dichotomy inside himself at all times, a health skepticism along with the dark side too and I think we're all kind of like that but um, 
the, these th- people that feel that way, it's perfectly acceptable for them to feel that way. But think about it from a logical standpoint, okay, how many humans do you have to experiment on before you understand all there is to know about humans? I mean, they talk about abducting them, doing these experiments. All you need to do is abduct one human being one time, cut him open, analyze your mind. You've got all the mystery right there before. You shouldn't have to do it over and over again. Why? Why they have to keep experimenting? If I... Cut, cut open an ant. I get a little ant. I dissect it. I'm going to learn almost everything there is to know about that little ant after I do the dissecting. Maybe I've got some sophisticated equipment that can figure out the kind of cognitive processes, if there are any, for the ant. And once I've done that, I know all there is to know about the ant. So why continue doing it? That's the thing that always bothered me about these UFO things. They're taking people up. They're doing these experiments. For what purpose? I mean, why? Yeah, that's that's a that's definitely the question. Didn't Cthulhu have some sort of reptilian or frog faced worshippers or followers? Yeah, he has. What's interesting about Lovecraft? There are people that that worship the entities, but Lovecraft makes it very clear these are kind of uneducated people, and they're they're just mistaken. You know, they they see something they can't quite understand why it is, but then they immediately assume that it is superior to them and they really don't know that either you know but it certainly does seem to have a power that they don't have and then they're drawn to it by like some kind of psychic connection and so what do they do they they, they do the human thing you got this powerful thing and what's a human's instinct now non-educated human's instinct what's a human's instinct to bow down your knees and worship him right and so that's a response but lovecraft makes it clear that that's an immature imperfect response to these entities so uh there are probably people out there usually the people that deal with these entities to deal with from a more magical standpoint where they don't view them as things that should be worshipped but rather as learning experiences energy exchange uh experiences but there probably are people out there that worship cthulhu just like they have in some of these lovecraft but this is not a mature sophisticated educated response to these entities at all but if you want to do it, I'm I'm perfectly open to everything. I mean, you can interpret these entities any way you want. You know, you can interpret them as just mental constructs, and I have the broadest interpretation of that. You can say they're actually aliens from other plants, so they actually have an ontological existence, the same as we do. And then you could argue that they're like entities that live between the dimensions, and so they're kind of like involved can only be approached magically i don't care how you view you know what a magician does is this a magical practitioner which i am what you do is this like i'm sitting in this room here right now i got a beautiful light on over on the right here right i came down here i flipped on the switch the light came on right that's all that i ask when i turn on the light the light comes on i can use its power to to sit here right but I don't need to know any kind of mystical things about the light. There are people that, for a living, they go out there and they climb on poles. They know all about circuit breakers. They all know about the flow of electricity. And they can fix these kind of things if my light went down, right? I don't need to know that. All I need to know is that when I turn the switch on, it comes on. And so when I do a magical ritual, you can call what I'm doing whatever you want. You can call the entities I'm uh, achieving some kind of contact where there's some kind of convert, conversing with a communion, you can call them whatever you want. All I care about is that I get my effect. So you could say, well, it's due to pink elephants with unicorn horns, or it's due to God, or it's due to the devil. Whatever. Call it whatever you want as long as the lights come on. That's all magical practitioners care about. That's all they should care about. And, and this is a debate that hardly started with us. This is something that goes on in the occult world and always has gone on and always will go on. The, the debate, I love it. I love yeah, the, the debate not? between is it an internal thing that I'm projecting or is it external? How I, there maybe there's no way to ever know that, and we have to find those answers individually on our own. Well, why do we have to find those answers at all? The quantum physicists say that a lot of times we're asking the wrong questions. You know, somebody will ask a question, they'll say, well, how come we can't measure uh, the magnetism of, of an of a electron or some, and the spin of an electron, whether it spins left or right, right? Why can't we do these things at the same time? And quantum physicists, well, we just can't, and we're asking the wrong kind of questions. Why ask questions like that? But you know what? I like these kind of debates. You know why? First of all, you must like the debates because you have this show, right? You have the show, and you get a lot of people that talk about these things, that believe in these things. I'm pretty sure you probably had a guest on that believes that Cthulhu somehow decimated the mind 
Italian culture, right? It's very great stimulating stuff. It's keeping your, you in business here. It's keeping us all happy and stimulated. It's allowing me to sell my books and my articles, certainly. You know, so more power to it. Debate all you want, but whether we can actually determine the answer to these things, oh, I'm not so sure about that. I think we're too imperfect and too human to be able to do that. Now, getting back to Lovecraft himself a little bit, was he an, was H.P. Lovecraft, did he have an unhappy life at all? He had a very short life. And what happened was he was very attached to places. A lot of people argue that Lovecraft was a real good person. He got along real good with people. But he actually was more interested in places than he was in people. And he had good relationships with people, but it was usually through correspondence. He had an incredible correspondence. And a lot of the people that were his closest friends never even met him. Like, uh, I don't think... Uh, Clark Aston Smith, who was another weird tale writer, I don't think he ever met Lovecraft face to face. And so a lot of the people liked Lovecraft. They liked him through correspondence, but they would sometimes visit him. And from all accounts, when he actually met people and he went on their little antiquarian, he would go around they'd look at architecture because he liked place rather than people. So he'd look at architecture and historical place and stuff. But Lovecraft was more interested, like I said, in places than he was in people. And secondly... He just could not tear himself away from Providence, Rhode Island. He tried to do it. He tried to move to New York. He got married to a person that actually kind of fell in love with him through his correspondence too, but it just didn't work out. He, he was not comfortable in a place like New York. He had to get right back to Providence, Rhode Island. That's where his creative energy was. And so as long as he could live in Providence, Rhode Island, he was fine. He was very creative. When he got back from New York, that was around the 1925 or 1926 when he left New York. He had his most creative period, and he suddenly started writing the fiction that made him famous, you know, with the star of the call of Cthulhu, and then all the works that followed after that. So I won't say that he had an unhappy life, but he was very unsuited to actually taking care of himself. And so he always lived with his aunts, and they were always living on the verge of poverty. He made some money selling his stories, not too much. He made more money revising the works of other people, but he could not hold a job. And he never graduated from high school, never went to college, so he didn't have any kind of training, either vocational or educational. And he was always a little bit embarrassed about that later on in life, but he really couldn't take care of himself at all. And he wasn't eating properly. He couldn't really take care of himself in terms of proper food, nutrition, and it kind of contributed to his early death. He died when he was 47 years old. It was in 1937, so he was only 47 years old. He died of intestinal cancer. I can't say he had an unhappy life, but he wasn't He wasn't always happy because of he was always on the verge of poverty. But i got to tell you, he did what he wanted to do. He didn't compromise. He did what he wanted to do. He had a small body of work, but here we are now – Look at popular culture. Look at the movies and stuff. If he was alive today, he'd be a billionaire, you know, and stuff. So he did what he wanted to do, but I can't say that his life was uh, more unhappy than the lives of other people. Edgar Allan Poe had a very unhappy life. The French poet Charles Baudelaire, who influenced the decadent movement over in France and in London, had a very unhappy life too. I can't say Lovecraft was in the same categories those people too yeah that's he, that's actually why i i asked you that I'm, I'm i'm familiar with poe just a little bit and i know that he just had the most the most depressing existence it, it's almost like reading about edgar Allan poe's life is just it's scarier than his stories to think that you know a person could go through their life and just and just feel such misery and unhappiness and just didn't he die slumped against a, a horse or something like that yeah. Well, he died in Baltimore. He actually was found unconscious on the street, and then they took him to a hospital, and he died soon after that. They claimed that what happened in that period of time, they had people going around. What they do, they'd round up drunk people or people that were kind of street people, and they'd put them in a place called a coop. And they would vote them. Like when there was an election, they kept voting them over and over again. They didn't have the kind of controls that they have in the voting booths now. So they'd vote these people over and over again for the candidates. And a lot of people claimed that when he went to Baltimore, he was kind of drunk. And they picked him up and put him in a coop. And then they kept voting him over and over again. But his health got worse and worse for a couple of days. And then they just abandoned him on the street. And his health had broken up. By that time, he was kind of had a brain lesion, by the way, too. That was around the time the, he wrote his his great poem, uh, 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 
Ulalum, and then the, uh, his uh, great cosmic piece, Eureka. And at that time, you could tell from the work that he had kind of some kind of mental lesion. But he had a very unhappy life. But you got to give these people, him and Lovecraft, both credit, despite the fact they had short lives. They got it all out there. And Poe was a lot more successful than Lovecraft in terms of getting his works out. I mean, his story, The Gold Bug, actually was a best-selling story. It earned him some money. He became world famous due to his poem, The Raven. And he managed to get all of his works in hardcover form before he died. So he was a lot more successful. Lovecraft never had one hardcover published version of his stories or any of his longer works in his lifetime. Never. When he died, he thought he was a complete failure. He only had those stories that were published in Weird Tales magazine. He had a couple stories that appeared in anthologies that gathered a little bit of critical attention. But he thought he was a complete failure when he died. He thought his reputation would just disappear and stuff. But you got to give him credit. you got to give Paul credit, too, despite the fact they had short lives and they were kind of unhappy a lot of times. They got it all out there. That should be an inspiration to all of us, right? How many people live a nice long life and they never get their creative stuff out there and they probably will have the kind of oblivion that Lovecraft feared would happen to him but they got it out there and despite the fact they didn't compromise Poe didn't compromise Lovecraft didn't compromise and right now they're considered two of the finest writers in the whole world you know so maybe they had an unhappy life but heck they're immortal oh yeah I I think that uh, it, just about everybody, like, like what you were talking about when you first came on the line, just about all modern horror seems to link back to those two, including um, Stephen King, who wrote an interesting story called It, which it sounds very close to something like H.P. Lovecraft would write about, except this is probably a, a much more humanized type of being. But if you watch the, if you read the book or watch the old miniseries, I haven't seen the new movie yet. It definitely reeks of an H.P. Lovecraft influence. I agree, and actually Stephen King actually paid homage to Lovecraft. I think he called, he wrote one time the Love Lovecraft. This is a great quote, by the way. But I do want to talk about it too because I think this is an interesting topic. But he made a quote one time: "The Lovecraft is the dark, baroque prince of the twenty twenty first century." The dark, baroque prince of the 21st century. He acknowledged the influence of Lovecraft on modern horror, and that influence is not going away anytime soon. Believe me. You know, that's why I'm going to this convention and the one at the Scarefest. They want me there to talk about this. Lovecraft is just as relevant today as he was back then, and we're waiting for the Hollywood producer or the director who can create who can actually create it the way that Lovecraft wrote it and give us the same kind of cosmic shows. But let's get back to It for a minute. You raise an interesting things. Notice, and I read the, story, the novel It. It's an enormous novel, by the way. There's a lot more stuff in there in Stephen King's novels than there are in those movies, just like in the Harry Potter books. But that's an interesting kind of thing. Think about it for a minute. Like you got this evil clown, right? What was his name? I forgot what his name was. Pennywise. Um, that's right. And it was played by Tim Curry to perfection. Who is also a very scary individual. <laughs> yes, he's a very scary individual. But I be, would be very interested to see a remake of this. I hope they can do it. But think about that story for a minute. Like what this did, this alien entity that's kind of like a big kind of spider-like thing, right? Living underground. That's very Lovecraftian. It's not, not a human being at all. It's some kind of strange, non-human centric being. But it projects an image outside of itself that kind of ropes people in and you notice that that image is totally human centric so you've got like a malignant entity that's kind of playing the human game and the people are perceiving it certain ways but their perceptions are off they're not really perceiving it the way it is so this is very very lovecrafting the only way that stephen king differentiates a little bit you mentioned yourself that you saw some human centric elements come in well, the way the lovecraft differentiate or the way king differentiates is that he makes his thing malignant and you have to wonder why is this spider so concerned about uh roping these human beings in what's his motives i i don't know you know in a lovecraft thing he wouldn't have a motive like that but everything else is very lovecraftian in that story yeah and yeah are, i'm starting to yeah. see the distinction now that you uh you know, you showed me this this perspective on things. You're right, Pennywise. Why does he care so much about scaring a bunch of kids? Is he is he really getting something out of it? I mean, considering he's supposed to be this powerful being from another dimension. Yeah. What's what's his goal? 
You know, I mean, I find that in a lot of Stephen King's too. Like that one, what was the one about the, there was an alien aircraft buried out somewhere and it had kind of greenish colors and then this person digs it up and then they find that it, it's like controlling a bunch of devices and stuff. I forget what that one's called. Uh, they made a movie about that too. It was Jimmy Smith's, but I'm trying to think what it's called. But it's kind of like the same theme. you got this alien presence that's buried under the ground and for some reason it's getting itself involved in human beings and it's, it's feeling like these devices it's having mental effects on people. So people are kind of seeing things and going out in the woods and their eyes you're turning green and stuff. Uh, Tommy Knockers. It's called Tommy Knockers. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's the same kind of Stephen King. And he kind of gets the Lovecraftian thing from that standpoint. But you notice the thing about it when you watch that movie, the reason why it's entertaining is because you got these humans. And the humans are kind of like, what do they call themselves? The girl named them something, the Loser Squad or something. And then they all became came famous later. And then the people that were picking on them kind of got their come up and said, at the end, one of them ended up in a mental institution and stuff. And all these other people became kind of successful. And a person that grew up as a nerd, kind of, they like that. You know, because it's the revenge of the nerds, right? An early version. Of the yeah, revenge. it makes it easier for for a guy like me to relate to, certainly. Well, a guy like me too. But see, I was a little different in high school because all my friends were nerds. Because I was into all this crap it, when I and I I hung out with people, and I was actually a member of a society called the Nerd Society at a time in 1971, 72, where they didn't really use that term. So I was kind of hung out with nerds, but I had an ad attraction. You know, I was really. I'm 63 years old now, and I'm going to just say this with as a mild amount of false modesty as I can. But I was an incredibly handsome, gorgeous person, so I could still get dates. Like I remember a cheerleader asked me out to the prom and stuff. So I was kind of an unusual nerd because I hung out with the nerds. I didn't make any apologies for it. Those were my friends, right? But also, if I wanted to, I could get the girls. I could hang out with the cool guys, the people that had the sweaters with the college letters, and I could go to all the homecoming if I wanted to. I could go to the prom. So I was always a special case. But There, I, there are I, the rare I, people that can do that, what you did, and just go from group to group. It, it's rare, but there are people out there like you that, that are able to be part of more than one group in high school. Yeah, so I didn't have any bullying or anything necessarily, and I didn't pal around with the cool guys, but they never had any problems with me. You know, they were always willing to accept me. They never made fun of me or anything like that. And like I said, cheerleader asked me out to the prom. She was perfectly happy to go to the prom with me. I, of course, was a nerd. I was as much a nerd as if I was goofy looking, right? And so when she came to ask me, I didn't really know how to respond because I was a nerd dressed up like a good looking gut person. So what I did was I just simply said to her, I said, well, I'll have to think about it. And then I said, excuse me, I have to do something that I just left quickly because I didn't know how to handle that. I was nervous and everything else. So I was a nerd deep down and stuff like that. And the nerd part of me that was like 99% of my personality admires movies like it because the cool people get their comeuppance and then later on in life, the nerds get their educations, all their college degrees, and then they're suddenly elevated and then the nerds are like janitors and stuff. And then stuff. So, and then the nerds suddenly become, the cool guys suddenly become real respectful. They're like reliving their high school days and the nerds have moved on. They're teaching college or writing books or whatever so the nerd part of me loved that kind of thing but don't you see that's the thing about the movie that's why the movie is so entertaining because of those human centric things but the the core of the movie an alien creature and then getting involved with human beings and when you look at it fully you have to ask yourself why why does a spider why is the spider championing the causes of a bunch of nerds why does he care you know, what's his motives? And that's not really answered by Stephen King. I'm, I'm not sure if you're, you're into this or not, but there's another show that is super popular right now, and it obviously borrows heavily from all the things that we talked about. John, have you seen Stranger Things yet? No, I haven't. Oh, you got to see that. What is it? A reality show or is it uh, fiction? Okay, it's actually a show that kind of emulates... It, it emulates the feel of horror movies from the 80s, and it has a really big Stephen King influence, and it, I, I swear there's some Lovecraft in there as well. It's about a group of kids. It, it's similar to it in that way where it's like some nerdy kids that, that uh, you know, maybe they don't fit in that great, but uh, they end up kind of becoming heroes, and I, I really think it's right up your alley. Okay, it's called Stranger Things? Yeah, it's super popular right now. I think it's on Netflix 
and you can just watch the whole first season in a row, and they're working on the second season now because it's such a hit. Well, I'll ask my daughter about My daughter is just in her second year of college. She's a sophomore at MSU where I went to, and uh, she's an expert on all this kind of stuff. You know, if I mention it to her, have you called uh, – she's walking by now. Ligia, have you heard of something called Stranger Things on Netflix? It's a horror kind of a thing. She has heard of it. So what I'll do is I'll just ask her. I could probably watch it on my phone, you know. Oh, yeah. You just need the, the app. The app. Yeah. And, yeah just pay for it she'll, and then you could watch it. Well, she'll get that app for me like almost instantly. Like this pr- thing that I'm doing at the end of the week, this uh, presentation, she animated the whole thing for me. You know, I just told her what words and what things I want to talk about and she set up the whole thing. It's just absolutely Oh, gorgeous. wow. You got a little computer genius there. Yeah, well, young people grew up with this kind of thing. I grew up in the 60s with, like, TVs and phones with cords on them and kids being outside all the time. Like, we didn't sit and look at cell phones. We were on our bicycles out playing all the time. And so this all came right now. I'm a college professor, and I teach online. So I'm okay with the online kind of environment when it comes to, like, Netflix and apps and stuff like that. I have to go to a, a stronger authority. But she'll she'll get me the application. I'll watch it on my phone. I'll get caught. You said they're starting their second season already? Uh, they're going to be releasing it soon. They just filmed it. And uh, the first season, it's it's all finished. It had huge, huge ratings and a great uh, reception from the critics. Definitely one of the more uh, nostalgic type of things that you can check out. If, if you were into things like like uh, Stephen King and stuff like that. Like I was saying, it's just almost tailor-made for that type of horror fan that's not necessarily into the blood and the gore and the jump out of nowhere at a 45-degree angle and scare the crap out of all of us. It's more of that creepy, eerie sort of horror feeling. Yeah, well, I'll take a look at You know, now King, you know, I've kind of been rethinking King a little bit, but King, some of his stuff, he kind of caters. He once said that in an interview. He said that if he can't go for the higher horror effects, then he'll always go for the gross out. So, you know, <laughs> he, he understood what he was doing, certainly. But when you look at some of other Stephen King's thing, like I read The Shining, too, and that novel's filled with stuff. And again, that one's kind of interesting because you've got like a hotel. It's kind of a big impersonal thing. You don't know why all this is happening there, but... There's like residues of different kinds of human uh, experiences there that manifest in the form of like I suppose you'd call them ghosts and stuff, but they manifest like that. But what I like about that one is he doesn't necessarily have an alien image, so he doesn't have to worry about causes or motives, why an alien would be mixing itself up in human concerns. I like The Shining because you've got these people that can actually – understand psychically or they have some kind of connection with some some kind of weird force there in this hotel but what the motives of the force is or what it's all about it's left totally unexplained i like that that's a lot cleaner i think than it or this tommy knockers kind of thing too so i i should probably revisit stephen king i haven't read stephen king in a long time i hope he's uh, is stephen king still alive and uh, operating well p- producing stuff I, I believe he is in fact he actually um, he'll actually do the vocal, vocal for his own audio books, and from what I heard, he's not really the best at doing it. But it's still kind of neat to think that you can actually hear him read his own books. Oh yeah, that is interesting. They claim that Edgar Allan Poe he would read his own poems at certain parts. Stuff they say he had a beautiful voice and he could do it very well. Lovecraft they said had kind of a squeaky, kind of infeminate voice, and he wasn't so good when it came to. Uh, Hart, Hart Crane, the author of The Bridge, the famous American poet, he, he once referred to Lovecraft. He met him at a party in New York, and he referred to him as a piping voice, piping voice person, you know. So uh, Lovecraft probably wouldn't be very effective reading his own works, but they said Poe could do it. Stephen King, I think, should hire somebody somebody really good that can sp- speak real good to do it. I think that would make more sense. He can certainly afford it. And, and this one might be a little bit of a stretch, but uh, another – a character that comes to mind is Sauron from Lord of the Rings. He was able to reach out and affect the minds of different evil characters and races like the orcs or the evil wizard uh, Solomon. He was able to do that. Are, were you into those at all, the Lord of the Rings things? I read The Hobbit. My brother read all that stuff, the whole Lord of the Rings trilogy. I read The Hobbit, and that was about as far as I went. I thought The Hobbit was very nicely written and stuff, but I never really got into it. 
Uh, so I'm not any kind. I'm not competent when it came, comes to that kind of thing at all. I took a different direction. My brother loved the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I understand they have a dark Lord there too and stuff like that. I, I'm always a little concerned about that. Like in Harry Potter, they have the dark Lord, and so it's a very human centric view of good versus evil. I always wondered once the dark Lord gets what he wants, like complete domination, what, what's left? You know, what, what's he got left? You know, I mean, he's just going to get assassinated, right? I mean, what? I don't get it. You know, I never understood the motive of mm-hmm. that kind of a thing. The universe is certainly not in accord with either good or evil, but the universe is certainly in accord with productivity and unproductivity. And the kind of evil that humans like to envision is very, very unproductive. It never goes anywhere. And then once you become dominant, you're a moving target all the time. I, I, I always wondered what the motive is. And, and that does beg another question that I, I just got to ask and uh, why, do, John? Why do you suppose that there's so many books based on, or I'm sorry, so many movies based on Stephen King's books and and other authors like Dean Koontz? But with Lovecraft, I I've seen maybe a handful of movies that are about his work, and and none of them really stuck out to me as really good. A friend of mine told me there's one that's really good, but it seems to me his stories are so good and he had such an impact. There should be a movie coming out based on his work like every summer. I think that what we need to do, first of all, I think our technology has gotten to a point where we probably could technologically represent some of these entities, right? The problem that Lovecraft have is the same problem that Edgar Allan Poe has. You'll notice that there's never really been a good movie about Poe either. They tried in the 60s. Remember all those Poe Movies with Vincent Price in them, uh, Samuel J. Arkoff Productions and uh, Nicholson, where you know they had like the Fall of the House of Usher, The Pit and the Pendulum, The Mask of the Red Death, and they actually did one called The Haunted Palace that I'm going to talk about on the weekend, which was actually based on Lovecraft's The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. So they called it by the name of a poem by. Uh, Poe, but it's actually based on that story. The problem that Lovecraft has is the same problem that Poe has. These guys are very good on description and atmosphere and creepiness, but they're very bad when it comes to plot. If you read Lovecraft, there's almost no... There are females in Lovecraft, but they're all kind of like witches or demonic kind of entities. Or one of them, like in the thing of the doorstep, there's actually an attractive woman in that one, but she's actually not really a woman. She's been possessed by her father, who was a magician, and then her body is actually an insmooth kind of a body, so she's going to turn into one of those fish kind of like frogs they talk about in Dagon. So she's like transgendered, trans species. So in Lovecraft, you don't get a conventional beautiful woman for a conventional lover to fall in love with. Right there, that cuts the possible Hollywood plots in half because you, you have to add that. You have to have a sexy woman and then a sexy man as the two protagonists. And then secondly, you have to have a lot of good plot incidents. And neither Poe or Lovecraft have a lot of plot in their things. Things happen, but they're like mental things that happen and they move at kind of a slower pace and it's kind of like an internal landscape as opposed to an external landscape. So it's very difficult making a movie because the people that make these movies They're going to invest a lot of money and they have to have a return on their investments. I have an MBA in finance and accounting. That's a handsome part of me that has that, right? And I got to tell you, you know, they're not going to put up a million dollar, a couple million dollars if they're not going to get a return on their investments. So they have to have a strong plot. They have to have a lot of human centric things. They have to have the sexy protagonist. And Lovecraft doesn't have that kind of stuff. And so far, Hollywood hasn't found a way like to, uh, work that stuff in and yet remain true to the spirit of Lovecraft. I think it'll happen in the future sometime, but it's going to take a particular kind of director, a particular kind of producer, and we haven't got that person yet. I mean, uh, did you ever see the movie Dagon? That's probably the most recent one. That was 2001. Stuart Gordon's movie? Uh, no, not yet. I'll, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, well, what it is is based on the shadow over Innsmouth, and it kind of follows the plot a little bit, but then what happens is what always happens in a Hollywood movie. You have a very sexy young woman, and then her nerdy boyfriend, and they don't miss it, and then you have a sexy evil mermaid type woman that's kind of drawing this guy to Innsmouth, and then he's going to actually mate with her, and they're going to turn into these half fish, half human kind of entities. But what the movie does is it takes every opportunity it can to show the these women naked, you know, and the the woman that plays his girlfriend is really a hot-looking blonde woman. 
uh, I think her name was Moreno or something. Raquel Moreno. She's an Italian actress. Very, very sexy, right? And then the one that plays the part of the mermaid is very sexy too. So you got these sexy women usually with their breasts out. Later on, the, the woman's completely naked, strung up, and being devoured by the Dagon that comes up from the ocean. Why a uh, big entity like that would want to eat a naked human woman is beyond me, right? That's never explained. But every excuse to show like gratuitous violence and sex and then just playing gore in the movie is not missed. They have a scene where an older man's skinned alive. The protagonist gets burned alive at the end and he's a kind of a hideous looking and he goes into the sea. Every opportunity for gore, for sensationalism, for sex and violence is taken in the movie and you can see what the problem is. You know, you need a director and a producer that can actually do a balance, maybe have some of these elements in there, and yet remain true to Lovecraft, and we haven't seen that happen yet. And it only happened one time in those Edgar Allan Poe movies in the 60s. The uh, Fall of the House of Usher, they actually managed to work in a kind of a love interest there, but they, it was very minimal, and the woman died before the movie was over, and then they followed the same theme of the fall of the house of usher where she comes back from the grave to revenge herself so they actually remain true to lovecraft to lovecraft to poe's story and yet they manage to get the handsome guy and the pretty girl in there too so they by minimizing it. so it can be done but i've never seen it in any lovecraft things usually they go for the gore and the sensationalism and that's unfortunate, but I think that there's a wide open future for that. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. In the meantime, whatever kind of crap they put out there, if it's based on Lovecraft, I'm going to go and see it. Okay, So if any Hollywood producers or directors, at least they've got one person that's going to pay the money and go to it at the big expensive theater and spend $20 for popcorn or whatever it is just because it's Lovecraft. But i got to tell you, I'd like to see them do a little bit better job on that. And John, how does this Lovecraftian system of magic work? Oh, well, it's basically, uh, it's, I've actually written my own rituals. I had to write my own rituals. In my book, I explore how the Lovecraftian entities and his philosophy too and his, his views have actually influenced the major black magical systems. And that's right now. Like if you practice chaos magic, uh, people practice chaos magic right now. And chaos magic, the founders of chaos magic, are unashamedly mentioned that they were totally inspired by Lovecraft's theories and his work. And I explore all that in the last chapter of my book. The Satanists nowadays, starting with Anton LaVey, who founded the Church of Satan in 1966, he uh, based a lot of his rituals, and in fact, in the satanic rituals, there is a whole section on Lovecraftian rituals. So he very unashamedly and directly showed the Lovecraft influence, and that's been growing today. Among the Wiccans, the Wiccan religion, uh, the Wiccans nowadays, people like Constantinos, who's a uh, modern neo-pagan, he's adapted Lovecraftian themes to the Wiccan religion. And you've got the Kenneth Grant's Typhonian OTO, which is based on Lovecraftian mythos, as well as a, it's a reworking of Aleister Crowley's mythos. That's still in operation today. And then the voodoo religion, at least in terms of philosophical, is based on Lovecraft as well, and the quantum physics kind of thing. So I explore in the latter half of my book the direct influence right now among these magical systems that use Lovecraftian themes and concepts. What I've done is I've written my own series of rituals, and I, I've got a grimoire that I'm working on now, and I'm going to get that published after my next book comes out where it's a series of rituals that people can do to actually have the kind of experience with these kind of Lovecraftian entities and it's it's all kind of going to be in that thing it doesn't require uh, very similar to Doctor Strange in which you don't have to invest in any expensive tools or anything everything you need you can conjure using your mental abilities you can conjure your weapons and your device and you can go into your alternate dimensions using the power of your own mind the only thing that people that practice this kind of magic needs they have to have very very strong ability to visualize and to do what occultists call dreaming true or lucid dreaming or astral traveling whatever you want to call it it's all the same thing you have to have very advanced abilities to do that in order to work this magic but it's actually uh, understanding what these alternate dimensions that Lovecraft talks about actually are and experiencing them. And when you experience them, you go into alternate dimensions and you don't go in the way you go in now. Your body's left behind and you're given a body suitable 
to the kind of places you're going, just like he talks about in the dreams in the witch house. I don't even know what the body looks like, if you want the honest truth. When I've gone to these rituals, I have an assistant that helps me in these rituals, two assistants, and they protect my body, and they protect the whole atmosphere of the place of working from the things that are drawn to these kind of rituals. So they're like playing in the trenches there, keeping everything safe, and I'm off in another dimension having interesting experiences. And then I get thrown back into my body at the end of them. So it's a very powerful form of magic. I developed it myself based on certain things I channeled and dreamed about. And I, it'll be out someday for people to use. In the meantime, if you want to work Lovecraftian rituals, you get yourself a book on chaos magic and, and Satanism. And you can work in Costantinos' books. You can study people like Donald Tyson who have their own rituals dealing with Lovecraftian themes. So there's a lot of Lovecraftian rituals out there that people can explore. You can do the Simon Necronomicon that came out on the anniversary of Crowley's, uh, of Crowley's, uh, Nativity, it came out, it's called the Simon Necronomicon. That thing is still in paperback. In fact, I was in the bookstore uh, the other day and it's still out there in paperback. So if you want Lovecraftian rituals, they're all over the place. You can use them, you can find millions more on the internet and online. You know, but I'm going to have my rituals out there in a couple of years, I would, I would hope. And earlier you talked a little bit about Lovecraft inspiring modern black magic systems and my question is, John, what do you think of this whole idea that there is a worldwide Illuminati conspiracy with black mag I'm sorry, black magicians behind it? Yeah, well, again, that's one of those conspiracy theories. It's not even clear that there is any Illuminati. You know, I've studied the, uh, you know, the um, all those silly mo- books by Dan Brown. Uh, what was it? The uh, what was Dan Brown? How come I can't remember that? It was a very famous movie with Tom Hanks. He's got a whole oh, series uh, about the. Oh man, now that, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, demons and angels, and what was the first one called? Uh, uh. Gosh, I should have that. That should be right on the tip of tip of my my other. Uh, uh, I gotta think about it for a minute. There. Uh, yeah, it was so popular. They made the movie, and and a lot of people thought that it was an actual real thing, and now now and other people said it wasn't, and I'm totally confused. <laughs> Yeah, I have to think about that guy. Well, how, how come I could have a mental thing? I'm 63 years old. My mind is so powerful. I probably will never get Alzheimer's, but every once in a while we have some of the, one of these kind of things. Oh, I, I got it. I just went ahead and Googled it. I'm, I got a computer in front of me. It's the Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code, right. Well, they kind of talked about it a little bit there, but they developed the Illuminati a little bit more in Angels and Demons because the guy claims the Illuminati. But you know there's no evidence for that. They claim there was this Illuminati and that people like Leonardo da Vinci and other thinkers of the time were members of it and they were trying to – it was like a hidden group underneath the church. There's no evidence for that. That's one of those conspiracy theories. And I like those kind of conspiracy theories. I, I, I wish they wouldn't bring black magic into it, but I can see how they – want to do that you know we still have this black versus white i mean still in the harry potter thing that black is evil and white is good and my interpretation i do define what magic is in the first chapter of my book and then i define the difference between black and white magic and i view black magic as just simply magic that you're using for power or for knowledge not spiritual perfection and it's not evil power or evil knowledge is just simply knowledge and power. You know, so that's the motive. White magic is being used for spiritual perfection. And I define evil and good as being based on behavior. And that's the best way I define it. You know, just because you're practicing magic, you're a black magician trying to get knowledge of power, that doesn't mean you're evil. You can still be ethical, right? You know, evil is when you start doing unethical things. Like we've had a lot of people like the popes and we've had priests and cardinals that have actually professed to be white magicians. In other words, they're interested in spiritual perfection for their divorce, but they're terribly bad in terms of behavior. They molest people. They engage in all sorts of evil actions. So those are evil people, even though they're white magicians. Aleister Crowley, I would argue, is a white magician because he was always through his whole life interested in perfection, spiritual perfection, turning man into God. That's what the Golden Dawn system they followed was all about when he formulated the OTO, which I was a member of, by the way, until 1984. 
that was designed to turn man into God. So it's kind of a white magical goal. And yet Crowley was an incredibly unethical person, an evil person. You know, so you can't define evil or good based on white or black magic. It's a confusion, and they keep doing this in the Harry Potter. Lord Voldemort, of course, is a very unethical person, but he's also the Dark Lord, right? The black magician and Harry Potter is good. Dumbledore is good. So he's a white magician. And they did that in the Lord of the Rings kind of thing. And they're doing that in these things now. The Illuminati is somehow a bunch of black magicians. First of all, there's no evidence there is such an organization or there ever was in history. There might be an organization now, but it's a relatively recent offshoot. And there's certainly no evidence that these people are black magicians, whatever that means. You know, so, but I like it, like I said, I like talk about this kind of stuff because it, it's your bread and butter talking about this kind of stuff. And I love it. The people that talk about this kind of stuff will go out and buy a copy of my book too. So from a very practical standpoint, have fun with it. I have an open mind. I'm perfectly happy to listen to any arguments one way or the other. But I must confess that I just don't happen to believe in those things yeah sure definitely no problem with that that's that's why we're here uh, it's healthy to have a perspective of somebody that doesn't believe in these things otherwise we might get lost in our own open-mindedness and lose all traction and ground on well, anything that's real <laughs> let me say one thing about when i say i don't believe i'm just saying there's no empirical evidence for it. that doesn't mean i don't have an open mind you know like a lot of people that do these hard house kind of things I believe that there's actually something happening in those haunted houses. When it comes to the alien abductions, I believe that there's something happening. I'm not so sure the interpretation these people put on is what the correct one is. Like when they go to a haunted house, I'm not so sure that that's a demon there. I'm not so sure that it's a spirit of somebody that died. But however, I do believe that whatever energy form there is there sometimes adopts these kind of things, adopts the form of a demon mm. or adopts the form of somebody that dies. But what it's doing, that's a concession to the people that are seeing it. And I would argue that what they see is what they brought to it. You know, if a person believes in the haunted house that my Uncle Fred was a very bad person and it's a spirit now, and then they see Uncle Fred, I believe they see Uncle Fred because that's what they brought to it. That's what they want to see. But that doesn't mean there's not something there. So I'm not denying that there's something there. I'm just denying that what people think is there might not be what's really there. And i got to tell you from my own experience, I've been invited to haunted houses before. And when I go there, they always talk them up. They say, oh, we've got this cold spot here. We've got this manifestation here. And then when I go to it, I never see anything. It's like everything in there suddenly behaves itself. You know, so I don't know what that is. You know, uh, 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 Andrea Perone, you heard the author of House of Light and Darkness, who's actually her novels were, uh, the, the, uh, they made a movie about one of them. So you probably heard of her, Andrea Perone. She once claimed that, that my will is real powerful and so when I go to these things everything behaves itself I don't know if that's true either but I have an open mind I know there's something there and when people did, talk did you, about did like, you see something at some point because uh, you know, before we got on air you mentioned something about a, a ghost experience did you, did, you, did you see or experience something at any point yeah I did I had two experiences now I'm not talking about my magical experiences those all happen in an alternate reality so we'll leave that aside for a minute I had a UFO and a uh, paranormal experience. The UFO one was pretty simple. We went up to Clare, Michigan. There were accounts of flying objects up there. We were in my friend's uh, Volkswagen. He had one of those old-fashioned Volkswagen. We were actually chasing something down the road. It was hovering just a few feet off the ground. It always stayed ahead of us just so far. There was lights on it, but we, it was misty out there. We couldn't tell where it is, but we could never catch up to it. We stopped the car. We got out. I actually hung back because I was a little scared about it, but they walked up a little closer, but they never could see where it was. And he would flash this flashlight, and then it would blink two times. And then he'd flash it three times, it would blink three times. And then he actually spun the flashlight around, and then it made a whirring sound and stuff. And then we got in the car and we tried to chase it again. Now, I would argue that what we saw, there was an unidentified flying object because it was flying. It was definitely hovering, and we couldn't identify what it was. But I'm not going to go so far as to say that this was actually propelled by aliens from another planet. I'm not going to go so far as to say that this was something that was created by somebody in Clare, Michigan, and they were just running it around pretending that it was from another planet. I could even 
go so far as to say it might have been a combination of like temperature inversion or light refraction or whatever, the things that the skeptics say. So I've got a total open mind, but all I can say is that I saw an unidentified flying object. When it came to the paranormal experience, we used to stay at this cottage that was up in Clara, Michigan, and it used to get fearfully dark in this old cottage. And uh, we had only two bedrooms. One bedroom I'd sleep in. My dad would sleep in the other bed. The other bedroom my grandparents would sleep in and my brother would sleep in. I had a twin brother. And then my mother would sleep on the sofa. There was no place for her to sleep. So she would sleep on the sofa. After midnight, I'd always wake up every night after midnight. And I could look out into the room, and it was very dark in that room, but we had an old-fashioned heater that would create this kind of weird orange light off in the corner. And I would look over at my mother, and the outline of my mother would get up out of her body, and I, it would sit in a rocking chair, which was, was right by the bed, and I could see through it. So I could see her features, I could see her body, but it was kind of a hazy grayness, and I could see the uh, mantle place behind it, and it was outlined by this kind of bright, whitish kind of light. And I would notice, I would get at the foot of my bed, and I'd look out into that living room, and it would see me looking, and then it would start walking toward me. And it had a look on its face I'd never seen on my mother's face, an evil kind of look. It put its arms out. When it got to the center of the room, it would disappear, and then it would appear in the chair again. It would do the whole thing all night long. Oh, wow. And then finally, I'd go to bed. Now, one time I wanted to test this. So I changed rooms with my brother. My brother would never wake up at night. He slept like a log, right? I would always wake up sometime after midnight to see this phenomenon. So I took, I was looking at it from a different perspective. I was looking at it from an angle from his bedroom. And I was looking directly out. I didn't have to go to the foot of the bed. The door was open. He was sleeping away in the other room. And I woke up. And I saw the figure sitting in the bed. And what was weird, it did all that, but then I could see it from the side view walking toward my room. So it didn't walk toward me. You would think if it was a mental image, it would walk toward me, right? But it walked from the side view. And so that kind of, kind of spooked me. One time, I can't believe I was this brave, but one time I was in the other room and it was walking toward me. I had, I could feel my hair standing up, chills up and down my spine. I got them right now as so I'm remembering this. And I walked toward it. I left the room and I walked toward it. I was trembling. And I was getting closer and closer to it. And then it vanished. And then I walked closer and it was rocking the rocking chair. I walked closer and right when I touched the rocking chair, it stopped rocking. And then it was all over. Now, what is that? Is that my my mother is alive, so she's not dead, so it's not her spirit. You could say it's an astral form of my mom. You could say it's some projection I create. I don't know what it is, but it is a paranormal experience, and I did see something, and I can't really account for it, so I've got an open mind. So what I've just told you is an absolute fact, but what it really is... I'm not sure. I know it's not. It wasn't a dead person because she was very alive and healthy at the time. What was it? Perhaps these energy forms that people see maybe 99% of the time in a haunted house is some form of energy like that. And Lovecraft talked about energy streams and aggregations of atoms and electrons. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. You know, but I keep an open mind about it. I'm not going to say that I made it up or I imagined it or anything like that. I actually saw it and I know the difference between imagination and seeing something with my own eyes. So I have an open mind up to that extent, but actually what it is, I, I really don't know. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And have you ever experienced anything weird while actually practicing magic? All the time. I get pulled into alternate dimensions when I do a magical ritual, and there's a lot of weird things that happen. And then I try and process them. I write them down and stuff. I get ad uh, insights about, but usually what I get is just information exchange with different alien things, and it has really nothing to do. I don't. I, it doesn't bring back anything. Sometimes I'll get back things that I can actually incorporate into rituals later on. Like once I got a bunch of symbols that I could use for a following ritual. So it will help me in my next ritual and stuff. But there is no practical use of any of this at all. It's just for knowledge and power. And it's just for the pure pleasure of doing it. I think the reason why people do magical experiences is not so much to gain spiritual perfection. They're gaining it just to gain knowledge. And because, quite frankly, they like to do it. They're stimulated by it. They're gaining things that they can't get in the real world. And I think that's the reason why they do it. I don't know if that answered the question. I don't know why I have an impulse toward doing this. I talked about how I evolved from horror stories to Lovecraft and then to magical practice, but I honestly can't tell you why I'm that way. But can anybody tell why? Why are we nerds? 
you know, why was I, why were you, you said you were a nerd when you were a pers- young person reading Stephen King stuff. Why were you like that? I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> why is the football player, he has a letter on his thing and why is he only concerned? Why when I went to business school where 80% of the people only interested in getting jobs to make a lot of money, they couldn't see past that. All they wanted to do was get a big house, a nice looking wife, have a bunch of cars and make money and nothing else. Why are they like that? I got no reason, no explanation for any of this. Yeah, I mean, one thing that you said earlier, I thought made a lot of sense, and it's the idea that we're we're actually gods on some level. Yeah, uh, God, with a qualification that we're not necessarily human-centric gods, not the kind of gods we create in our own images, but there is something more. You know, there's something behind the veil, if you want to put put that put it that way. And we're just trying to figure it out. I think the honest reason why people do UFO investigations or why they go into those haunted houses or why they do magic is because they're just trying to understand if there's a little bit more and whether or not that's actually going to help us in any way or whether it's going to stop us from lying, uh, stinking and rotting in the grave, as Reagan said in The Exorcist. You know, she said, that "What happens?" They ask her, "What happens after death?" She says, "We just lie stinking and rotten, lying in the grave." Basically, the way the atheists play, we want to maybe think that there might be a way to avoid that or to get to some level of understanding. Perhaps it's that. I, I, I really don't know. You know, but I think we have to be willing to accept death. I, 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 the Harry Potter books have taught us that. If nothing else, you can't, you can't actually live forever in this kind of form. You have to be willing to accept. Death, and if you do that, the death of this kind of form, the dispersal of the, this aggregation of electrons and atoms, you have to be at least willing to accept that. And then whether there's something else after that, I don't know. Maybe if we do enough of these kind of experiences, we'll be comfortable, uh, and we'll be able to understand more. But I, I don't know. You know, I, I really, these are things that are close to all of us, unfortunately. And, and pardon me if we touched on this already, but, John, what is your favorite H.P. Lovecraft story? Oh, gee, everything after The Call of Cthulhu is perfectly written. If I have to be pinned down, and I hate to be pinned down because they're all so good, every year I usually reread everything they wrote uh, from 1920s onward. I read everything. I'd have to say my ultimate favorite stories are The uh, Dreams in a Witch House, because that one's very... Uh, quantum physics kind of oriented. And then I really like the Dunwich Horror. Uh, that's a good one. They made a movie about that one too. I'd love to see a good movie of that one. And then I would have to say that uh, I, I really like the case of Charles Dexter Ward. These are all stories that have magical practitioners in them, by the way, so I'm kind of biased a little bit, I'll say, toward the magical practitioner. But they're all great. I mean, they're all great. Uh, the ones I'm going to concentrate on in my presentation are two of his finest stories, The Mountains of Madness at the Mountains of Madness and The Shadow Out of Time. And those are the ones that are the scariest and The Color Out of Space, too. Those are the scariest because they express perfectly the ultimate cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft. You know, So those are the ones I'm going to concentrate on on my presentation. But those ones that I named, but I can't more than... Uh, more than strongly suggest a lot of the people to actually just get out there and read some Lovecraft. You'll you'll just be amazed because he is like what Stephen King says, a dark Baroque prince, and uh, you just it'll just repay whatever kind of reading and study uh, you can give it. You know, and I I encourage people to do that. And I mean, more people buy my book too, of course. But you know, that's the MBA part of me that's talking. You know, but I mean, the Lovecrafting stories are just just fantastic, and they're not matched today. You can read his his imitators, the Cthulhu mythos people who write in stone. They still try and picture them as monsters, or from the human standpoint, that's not what Lovecraft's all about. Lovecraft is about changing perceptions. And John, we are approaching the end of the interview. We we went just a little bit over, but what I'd like to do right now is just open things up for you and give you one more opportunity if you'd like to get on the soapbox one more time and just say whatever you would like to say to all my listeners out there. And then, of course, feel free to go ahead and follow that up with anything at all that you would like to promote or plug. Yeah, I'm going to do my plugs. Plugging is so much fun. I had an article coming out in New Dawn magazine published in Australia this uh, month. It's called H.P. Lovecraft and the Elder Sign. And uh, what I do, like I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, 
and I, I have my blog. I have two blogs, one on Goodreads, one on Amazon, then my regular blog too. And I have a website. And on my website and my blogs, I always put down all my events and stuff. So you can go there and on Facebook too. I'll have links to everything on Facebook and Twitter too. So if you go to any of those kind of things, uh, you can always find all my events and everything else. And you can kind of hook up to things. Like I'll publish little things. And you can go right there and read them. The mag, the article, of course, you have to purchase the article for that. I talk about all my upcoming conventions and radio interviews like I posted on Facebook today, this interview. And so when it's actually available for download or listening, I'll put links for that. So you can go to all those things, www. Uh, John L. Stedman.com, my blog. And all you do is just go, you know how Google Chrome, you go into Google Chrome, you'll find everything there. So you won't have any problems finding my stuff. I am going to be at that convention, so I'm going to give a presentation on Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to have copies of my book for signing, and that will be the 25th, 26th, and 27th. I'm also going to be at the Scarefest, the Scarefest uh number 10 convention in Lexington, Kentucky, and that will be at the end of September. So that will be Friday the 29th through Sunday the 1st. I'm going to give uh, my uh, speech, uh, Lovecraft's Cosmic uh, uh, Cosmic Scare Fest. So that's going to be a variation of the same presentation I'm going to give at the Carnival Horse. So if people are in the area, like in Buffalo, New York, or in Lexington, come out and see me, sit and chat with me. And by the way, if you go on Facebook, all you do is go on to Facebook, and I'll be I'll accept you as a friend or whatever, and we can talk more about these things. Like on Facebook, I not only put my little promotion things, but I'll post things from time to time. Like I'll find a creepy picture or just an interesting picture, and I'll post it on there, and I'll tell a little story about what I try and do on Facebook is be uplifting. I try not to do anything negative. I try to encourage people to just keep seeking things. Be productive. Keep keep your mind open. Keep moving forward. Keep being open to like other things besides more narrow views. And I try and promote people to love themselves. And I try and make it clear to you there's nothing mystical about getting this book published. The only reason why I got this book published and these other things is because I never stop. You know, when you get these things published, you get a rejection, you get everything else, right? But what you got to do is kind of grit your teeth and say, well, I've got to just keep going. I've got it out there. People will succeed if they just don't give up, if they don't say, I can't do it. You can succeed and do everything. Anything you want, you can succeed, but you got to not give up. you got to say, well, maybe the things I believe in, the things are, are like other people's, but... Only you can do it the way you do. You're totally unique. Whatever you want to do. Maybe you're going to be a rapper. Maybe you want to be the president. Look at Trump here. This is a 70-year-old man who always wanted to be president, right? Did you see how hard he worked for that? He outworked everybody. And here he is, president of the United States right now. He's 70 years old. I always tell my students, I'm a college professor, I tell my students, if a 70-year-old man who says like crazy things all the time... Uh, can actually get elected president because he won't stop, but he just kept going. Why can't you guys achieve what you want? You're in your 20s, for God's sakes. You're not 70 years old. You're full of energy. You're full of life. Go for your dreams right now when you're young and strong. And if you don't give up, you'll get your book published. You'll get your rap music song. You'll get that contract with the NBA. Whatever you want, you'll get it. But you got to keep going and not stop and not take no for an answer. Yeah, I like what you said just now. Uh, say what you want about Trump. Everybody's got their own opinion. But I think one thing that we can all agree on is that guy's a heck of a hard worker. He's a hard worker. He doesn't sleep that much. And you can say whatever you want to say about He's 70 years old. My God. Uh, people now, I'm 63. Like a lot of my uh, colleagues, they don't get anything published. They can't get a book out and they moan about it all the time. Well, I could have done this. I could have done that. Well, you can still do it if you're in your 60s. You can still do it in your 70s. The only difference is you got to do it. You gotta just keep moving toward it and not give up. You have to have a thick skin. Somebody, well, it's not right for me right now. Well, why take that as negative? A person says, this book isn't right for me right now. I got so much rejection and I took them at their word. It's not right for them, but it's gonna be right for somebody, but you gotta keep going. If you give up, then you're gonna be sitting somewhere when you're older saying, I could have done this. I could have done that. Nobody wants to be in that position. You do it right now. When you're young and strong, 
you give up. You keep moving forward until you're stopped. And then you have to grit your teeth and say, I'm never stopped. I'm never stopped. And everybody out there listening right now, you're unique. You can do it, but you got to keep going. You got to not stop until you do it. And then once you're up there, it never ends. Like right now, the publishing company is kind of shuffling their feet on this other book because it might not be quite their cup of tea. Well, I thank them for the big break. I have an international relationship right now. Somebody will publish that book, whether it's there or not. Somebody will do it if I keep pushing. All of us out here listening right now, you're no different than I am. You have special talents, special uniqueness. Just do not stop. Awesome. And and John, very well said, first of all. And also, I had a great time talking to you tonight or today, this evening. And I would definitely love to do this again sometime in the future. Okay, great. Well, when they publish that second book, I'm going to get in touch with everybody that I've done interviews for and see if they want to go a second round because that's the kind of guy I am. You know, so I'll we'll be in touch about that. But I really thank you for the opportunity. You know, I'm looking at your picture here. You look like a really interesting kind of fellow here. Looks like you're ready for an eclipse with those sunglasses. I must say, <laughs> that's my uh, escape the matrix look. Oh, did you did you see the eclipse? By the way, did you put on some glasses and look at? Sadly, I'm I'm boring enough to have actually slept through the whole thing. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of regret it now, but I, I was working on the show and I got tired, but I should have just got my butt up. It's a, it's an opportunity that I miss, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you probably didn't miss anything. Some people actually looked at it and they might have had retinal damage, you know, so you probably did yourself a service by ignoring it. Trump actually looked at it with no glasses on for a second, <laughs> if you can believe. They have a picture of him looking up, pointing up, and one of his aides is yelling, put the glasses on, put the glasses on. And he did. He put the glasses on afterwards. But he actually glanced up there once and pointed at it. <laughs> this, you can't tell this guy anything, this 70-year-old guy. you know, He just keeps rolling forward no matter what. Racist, calm, whatever you want. He's rolling forward. He wanted it. All you, you young people out there with dreams, the only difference between you and people that get the dreams is they just would not take no for an answer. I'd like to end on an inspirational note. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely appreciate that. I've got a little little bit of a positive motivational speaker type thing going myself, or at least I like to think that. So I certainly enjoyed and liked that very much. And uh, one other thing is, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but they're actually working on this whole new HP Lovecraft video game that's supposed to come out around Christmas or something like that. So uh, that might be something that's totally irrelevant to you, but it it does make me appreciate that the younger generation and and people out there are, are really still into this sort of thing. Well, I hope so, because I want to sell my second book. <laughs> you know, from a practical standpoint, I hope they're into it. But I'll check that out, too. I'll make a note that I may know that other thing you were talking about. I'm going to have my daughter look it up on next. But what she does when she watches these things, she gets an application. She uh, looks at the entire series. She'll just sit and look at the entire series of something she's in. She likes stuff like uh, Sailor Moon and things like that, you know, so she'll watch entire series of that in the summertime when she's not in school, you know, so I'll probably do that. I'll probably watch the whole first session via an app like that, you know, but I may know that. I'm going to make a note of this uh, HP Lovecraft video game coming out, too. I hope they do a good job with that. Yeah, absolutely, and and you will enjoy that show. It's not too violent, so you could probably watch it together. But until I talk to you next time, John, thank you so much for joining me, and and you just, you have a great evening, my friend. You too. Thanks for the opportunity. Talk to you later. And that was John L. Stedman. What a fascinating guest. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up some music. I'm a little slow today, so forgive me. I'm gonna pull up some music. And we're going to take a quick 10-minute break, and then we'll come back here. We've got a few things to talk about. I'll talk to you in a little bit.
Raising consciousness and awakening mankind. This is End of Days Radio. And welcome back to the end of days. This is your host, Daniel, coming at you all the way from the broken ruins of Babylon. Oh, excuse me. I do apologize for that extra long break to all of you live listeners out there. I know 99% of you listen to the podcast, which is perfectly fine. But I needed a little bit of an extra break right there. I hate to admit I've fallen back into old habits. I've got a pack of pepperoni sticks next to me and an orange Mountain Dew. So those two things that I've been trying so hard to quit, I just can't seem to let go. They're so good, especially when you're a little tired and you had to take care of a lot of things during the day. And you need a little pick-me-up because you have a podcast to record. Or I'm sorry, radio show. Some people don't like that word podcast. You know, when I was uh, teamed up with Michael, he never liked the word podcast. He always wanted, he always wanted us to call, call it a radio show. He was really offended by the word podcast. I don't really mind, but when you think about it, it isn't really just a podcast because we do broadcast live, and that's not a podcast. We're not just on the iPod or devices like that. You can download direct online, you can listen to this show so many different ways, including on YouTube. Just look for End of Days Radio on YouTube. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so there's so much stuff to talk about. Oh my god. I guess Alex Jones came to my hometown, Seattle, and initially when I heard this, I was really... <laughs> I was really disappointed because I would have liked to go down there and confront his butt. Seriously, I would have liked to go down there and I would say, Alex, I know what you are. You might fool these other people. You might fool this person or that person, but you do not fool me. I know what you are and I know what you did. No, I'm just kidding. I do know what he is, though. Uh, apparently, he came to Seattle and he had a camera guy following him and he had excuse me I had to close something out he had he was walking up to different people on the street the whole thing I should start off by saying the whole thing looked completely fake it's on YouTube just look up Alex Jones Seattle it's going to be one of the more recent videos not that recent I think it was like a week ago but he came to Seattle and he was talking to supposedly random people on the street and they all had something negative and nasty to say to him one guy even threw coffee in his face. The guy was getting in his face, and he was throwing coffee in his face. And nobody said anything about, Alex Jones, you're a disinfo agent, or Alex Jones, you're just a greedy cocksucker trying to sell MREs and penis pills. Nobody said anything like that. They said just stupid shit, some kind of communist crap that I did not even dis- I was not even able to decipher. So nobody actually called him out. I would have liked to have called him out, because let me tell you, if I would have been there... Holy crap, that was a really loud car that just went by. I apologize for that. But if I would have been there, I would have been able to give him an earful, and I would have been able to put him in his place, so to speak. I, I don't care how loud he would yell in my face. I don't care what he would have to say. He would not be able to outsmart me, outdebate me, or anything like that. And don't don't you out there think that he could do that to me? Don't you think that that idiot could ever hang with me in a debate? Don't ever think that because he couldn't. He's a moron, and everything he has to say is garbage. And listening to him, watching him, is a waste of time because he's only here to distract, divert, confuse, and basically just act like a big fat shill. And that's what he is. He's a big fat shill. He should be concentrating on losing weight. He should be eating turkey burgers and salads instead of giving himself a heart attack by yelling about nonsense on his YouTube videos. <laughs> so anyways, Alex Jones, he comes to Seattle and he does this obvious fake video trying to make my city look like a city full of retards. 
let me tell you something. If you walk down the streets of Seattle, nobody is going to treat you that way. Maybe one in a thousand might treat you that way. Maybe some crazy homeless person might treat you badly, especially if you provoke them. But typically, when you walk down the street and you start conversations with people, you are going to find some of the nicest and most intelligent, most liberated, most artistic people on the planet. And I say that as somebody that is probably more conservative-minded than most up here. So Alex Jones, do not come to my city and duck me and insult my city. Why don't you come here and face me like a man? Oh, I, I'm not big enough, right? I'm not big enough. I don't have as many listeners as you. So what? So what? Is that what it's about? I heard you on Coast the other night, and all you could talk about was how many listeners you have and how many listeners George Nori has. Well, news flash for you. If you're really in it for the right reasons, you don't care how many listeners there are out there. You don't care, because you're, you're not sitting there counting numbers and counting beans and thinking about how much money you're going to make. That's why we know that you're a fraud, because you are so arrogant and so foolish that you would actually talk that way openly. Instead of being a smart sneaky fuck, you're a dumb sneaky fuck and a fat sneaky fuck. And I know it's trendy to bash Alex Jones nowadays. I get that. And you know what? Many of those people doing it, they're copying me directly. That's right. Many people out there that are now bashing Alex Jones are copying me directly because they listen to this show and they think it's interesting when I say these things. So they just copy. And that's fine because you know what? He deserves it. <laughs> so, so I have no problem with anybody out there copying any of this. Uh, you know what? It, you know why it really bothers me is because this is our hero. This is our spokesperson. This is the face of the alternative news. You know what I mean? That's not. That's not my representative. That's not who I want representing me. I don't think that's who you want representing you. So anyways, enough of my hatred. <laughs> At least I'm pointing it in a positive direction. Okay, so the other thing is... A lot of people out there... I've noticed... And I'm sure many of you have... A lot of people out there are very judgmental. And this is a problem... In society... And it's a problem that, who knows why we have this issue. But when we see somebody, they say in the first seven seconds, we judge who they are and we come to a conclusion and we decide who they are to us within the first seven seconds. And I find that to be completely ridiculous. I think that everybody has something to offer out there. I think that everybody has a unique perspective, and I believe that every perspective is valuable. A lot of times, doing a show like this, I'm going to have certain people on here that might rub a lot of people the wrong way. I might have a Satanist on here. But keep in mind, I'm not having a Satanist on here because I worship Satan or anything like that. I'm having them on here because they have a unique perspective. Do you remember do you remember the story of Star Wars? Well, part of the reason why Darth Vader joined the dark side was because he was tempted. He wanted to see what was there, what he was missing out on. What happens when you give in to all your hate and rage and all of that stuff? You know, that famous quote from Yoda, hate leads to anger, anger leads to frustration, and frustration leads to diabetes, and diabetes leads to the dark side. That's exactly how it works. But we don't protect ourselves from that element. We don't protect ourselves from darkness by burying our heads in the sand. In fact, the more we know about these topics, the better we are able to protect ourselves from it. We don't protect our children by making them ignorant. We don't protect them by hiding certain concepts and ideas from them. It just doesn't work that way. 
I believe in facing this stuff head on, and I believe in letting anybody speak and hearing their perspective, whether you agree with it or not, whether they are whether they are a left-handed path or right-handed path or whether they're an atheist or a believer in God or whether they have mantis alien friends that they commune with occasionally. I'm not really caught up on playing Mr. Skeptic and splitting hairs and putting people up against the wall and say, oh, you're lying, or, you know, try to trap people or trick them up or trip them up. I'll never be that kind of host because... I think somebody like that is just disrespectful and rude. And I wouldn't want to go on a show where a host treats me like that. In fact, I would not only want to go in there, but I'd tell everybody I know to stay the hell away from it. Because I don't believe in being rude to people. So sometimes I'll get I'll get feedback and a person will say, Daniel, you never press your guests. You just let them speak and you never challenge them. Look, this is an open show. We've got an open phone number. If you want to do that... You can call in and do it your damn self. I'm not going to be rude to somebody or question what they're saying after I invited them on my show. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. Because they're sharing their time with me. I'm not going to sit there and press them and and try to expose them. And uh, Where are you even going to get doing that? You think you're going to get them to share their knowledge base with you? I mean, that has more to do with you trying to force your perspective on others. That's being judgmental. That's being pushy. That's being rude. That's not me. If you need that, if you want to listen to somebody that's going to be rude to their guests or judge them or challenge them or play Mr. Skeptic, then you've got to go, go watch some Penn & Teller stuff because that's not me. It's not me. Sometimes I have a little bit too open of a mind. Sometimes I believe stuff that I probably shouldn't. Like, Cthulhu eating the Mayan civilization. I still say that's true. I don't care what anybody says. Cthulhu, he destroyed the Mayan civilization. He wiped them out. It was him. And and he's the one that destroyed a lot of other civilizations. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know anything like that. I'm just joking. But I do think that... I see, this is something that I could really get into because I have this debate with so many people. Are these things that we experience, are they external, are they internal, are they technology, are they products of our own mind, are they holograms, is it the Mandela effect, are they tulpas, are they energy projections created by others and sent after me? Any one of those things could be true. Everything might be consciousness. How, how do you even begin to tell another person what's what or what's true and what's not? It's impossible. Everything is beyond comprehens comprehension. What does a cactus growing in the desert need to know about metaphysics? He just needs to grow in the desert and have enough water to survive. It's not important that that cactus in the desert understands the nature of reality. He's just here. He's enjoying himself. Maybe I need to do that more. Maybe I need to relax more. Maybe I need to have a, a few more drinks now and then. Who knows? Maybe that would help. Maybe it wouldn't. But the point is that none of us really know, and that's why the show's here. I don't make any money off of this. I, I Sometimes I wish I did, but I don't. But that's fine with me because that's not why I'm doing it. I do this because it's fun. I was at the music store earlier. I talked to a couple of guys. They asked me what I do, why I was buying these maracas. I said, hey, I got a podcast. It's about paranormal stuff. I don't make any money off of it. And they made a weird face at me. <laughs> I just do it because I'm spreading knowledge of the paranormal. And they made a weirder face at me. No, no, don't don't judge. It's not all lies, I swear. And they kind of nodded their heads a little bit. <laughs> I think I was getting somewhere with those guys, but they're super cool. I don't have anything against them. I bought a pair of maracas. Where are they? Here's one of them. A little bit... It's not as bad as the tambourine. And it's louder than this little egg shaker thing that I bought. So I'm always looking for new musical toys. As many of you know, I am a guitar player. I do very much enjoy playing the guitar. The guitar. 
And I love it. I mean, that's like my main thing right now is playing the guitar. Like when I wake up, the first thing I think about is I want to go play some guitar. I don't know why it's so consuming. I don't know why it's so important to me. I was like this. I was like this about uh, MMA training. I got into that. I wanted to be a fighter, and I'd go to the gym and I'd try to work harder than everybody else, and I would keep showing up, keep getting my head battered around, and it was a really great experience. But I'm not sure that that's my path. I'm not sure really that. Look, I'm 36 years old. I'm not 36. I'm 34. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm absent-minded. I'm 34 years old, and I probably don't have time to turn myself into a champion fighter, and that's okay. I don't need to be. So now I'm exploring more artistic things. I'm getting older. My body's breaking down. I don't see chasing championship gold as realistic at this point. A lot of people would argue that and tell me to do it anyways, and I totally get that. And I do want to have a fight someday. I want to have one fight. I'm not a violent person. I'm not advocating violence. I'm not nothing like that. It's just something that I'm passionate about and something that I love. And once you see past the violence, you start to see the art. And that's what's really important to me. But like I said, I don't think that's realistic. (laughs) I'm not going to go in there and, you know, be able to fight Conor McGregor or or somebody much larger like Brock Lesnar. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to try to fight Brock Lesnar and he's going to he's going to turn me into a human pancake. So that's probably not not a realistic approach. But but the thing is chasing that goal has to be one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced in my life. To really feel like I'm doing what I need to do and really feel align feel in alignment with my true self and and having a goal and knowing what I want and chasing after that, being sure and positive and feeling right as rain, that is a great feeling. So whatever it is to you, whether it's guitar, whether it's drawing pictures, if you're some sort of pervert that likes latex or something like that, you know, whatever it is, I don't care. Whatever it is that makes you... Tick, whatever whatever floats your boat, whatever blows your hair back, you should enjoy to the utmost extent. And you shouldn't worry about people judging you or anything like that. I don't care if you're into these magic cards, if you or these tabletop games or whatever nerdy shit. Don't don't ever let anybody make you feel like you can't enjoy those things because it's not cool, because you're afraid of what people think. Once you start doing that, that's when you really start to lose. And that's when you lose track of who you are and what you're doing. I'm I'm going too long on this, aren't I? <laughs> Let's move on. I, sometimes I'm starting to develop that instinct where I'm like, oh, I've been talking about this too long. Time to move on. I think that's a good thing. So, uh, this person says, oh, this is a bit of fan mail. Remember, you can email me at danielendofdaysradio at gmail.com. Email me guest suggestions, whatever. You can also go to the forum at endofdaysradio.com. Just click on forum. We're trying to build the community there. I've been trying to post in there a little bit more. As some of you know, I have another website that I run, and and uh, you know sometimes I get a little overwhelmed because I have so much on my plate. But this end of days radio forum, I really want to build this community and turn the whole thing into a knowledge database of occult, supernatural, paranormal. So anything you'd like to share, please join up and and take part in the discussions there, if you're into that sort of thing. The thing about Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, it's a different type of interaction, and you're always kind of under that umbrella. Don't be afraid to step out of that, because the worst thing that could happen is for the entire Internet to be Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. We still need websites and individuals out there that can keep the internet free so we have free speech and nobody limiting the knowledge that we're able to share with each other and and books too don't forget about books look stuff that's online it's only there so long as that computer is plugged in even if it's on a cloud i mean a cloud's a little bit better because all the information is kind of everywhere but still an emp or something like that it's all gone books hey you could dig up a book from a thousand years ago and 
If it was preserved somehow, you'll still be able to read it. Books aren't going anywhere, people. Neither is TV. And did you see the ratings for the last Game of Thrones? Holy crap. Apparently TV is not dead. Uh, okay, so I have a letter here. Dear Daniel, please recommend me a cool book to read. You are very smart, and I would love to read something that has inspired you. And that's from Chantel. Well, Chantel, don't confuse my open mind and my positive attitude and my enthusiasm towards science and paranormal as smarts. Trust me, you're just as smart as me, and we're all just as smart as each other. Nobody out there is smarter than you. But I do have some books that I would like to share with you. The first one is, I've recommended both of these before, but they're really great books, and I think everybody should read them. I think everybody should read them. The first one is Discerning Alien Disinformation. That's by Tom Montauk from Montauk.net. And he actually gives his book away for free. You can just go to his website and either read it on his website, and I think you can get a PDF copy, too, off of there. I think he lets you download a PDF copy. But go there and read that. You're, if you read that, you will understand deception so much better. And you will understand the way that these alien groups, whatever they are, they're able to form public perception and create a lot of propaganda with abductees. And there's most likely an agenda behind it when they tell people these lies. So I really recommend you read that book. It's something that influenced me quite a bit and probably my top three things that everybody should read. Everybody that listens to End of Days Radio, anyway. And the second one is Supernatural by Graham Hancock. I'm sure all of you guys out there know who Graham Hancock is. He hasn't come on this show. It's probably not, still probably not quite big enough for him, even though we've had plenty of big guests on. But it's okay. I won't hold it against him. He's a busy guy and... To be honest with you, I'd rather him just be out there writing more books for me to read rather than worrying about going on every podcast. So hats off to Graham, Graham Hancock and his book Supernatural, probably one of the best books that I've ever read and definitely part of my top three things that everybody who listens to End of Days Radio should read. That's Supernatural by Graham Hancock. And I have lots more books, but... I'm just going to go with those two for now. If I can even get one person to read either of those, shit, that'd be an accomplishment. But I'm not going to start listing off more and more books. I can barely get through them all myself. I mean, I have people sending me books, and it's like, oh, man, I got to gotta book somebody, but I got to read their book first, and it's so long. And sometimes I'm able to get through it. Sometimes I'm not. I, I have a stack of books that people sent me that I haven't gotten all the way through yet. I just don't have enough time, and I can't bring them on the show until I read the book, and the books are long, <laughs> but I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them. So you potential guests out there, don't stop sending me books. I love books. They are more valuable than gold to me, and I will read every single one of them. And I did want to say that... I did want to say that... Sometimes people ask me what type of magical practices I'm into. Like me personally, me, Daniel. You want to know what kind of weird shit am I doing alone in my basement? <laughs> what, what, what sort of things am I up to? Really nothing. Uh, there's two main types that I like to use. The first one is protection-related stuff. You know, building a force field around yourself, using the lesser... The Lesser Banishment of the Pentagram Ritual. Am I forgetting a part of that? I don't know. Stuff like that. I think I think things like that go a long ways as far as clearing your own headspace and keeping you from being influenced by other things. I mean, I'm not saying that if you do something like that or this, you're going to be completely immune, but I think that protection stuff goes a long ways. I think everybody should do it. That's my belief. And other than that, the other thing that I like is the 
the visualize visualization stuff, visualizing something that you really want to achieve, visualize something that you're really after. Like maybe I want to be a great guitar player. Well, I've always got that in the back of my mind that that's where I'm headed. That's my goal. And everything that I do or many things that I do at least are going to be contributing to that end goal. So visualization, setting goals, I think there's a lot of power in that. And some people say you got to write them down. And, and some other people say that you don't need to. You can do it all in your mind. It's another one of those debates, kind of like, are demonic beings internal? Are they extensions of myself, or do they actually exist out there? What's the answer to that? If I had that answer, then there probably wouldn't be a need for shows like this, because we'd already have everything all figured out. But I don't. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm not into summoning Cthulhu or anything like that. Now now that I talk to John, I kind of want to now. <laughs> I just for shits and giggles. I mean But no, I, I don't I don't really do anything besides that. I I think that a lot of it's interesting, like the Enochian stuff. I mean who wouldn't want to who wouldn't want to talk to angels and get into all of that stuff? Who wouldn't want to Summon a demon, not me. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, really spooky stuff like that. I just don't... I, I, I already believe demons exist. I don't need to prove anything to myself. I don't need to summon one. That's my belief. If you don't believe that they exist, that's that's up to you. And maybe that's better in some ways. But I believe they exist. And I don't think that I'm going to learn anything valuable by encouraging any sort of interactions of that nature but hey i could be totally wrong i've had guests come on here and tell me that that's one of the best things you can do because those things can teach you a lot about yourself they're they're demons that have literally come to bless you isn't there a saying like that sometimes god will send the devil to bless you yeah so things aren't always black and white that's something that i definitely agree with our guests today that things are not always that discernible so don't be so judgmental if somebody doesn't believe in the same religion as you if they're poor they don't have much money if their hygiene isn't very well everybody should have good good hygiene let's be honest here. <laughs> don't tell me that you can't grab a hose and just like hose your butt off <laughs> buy some baby wipes baby wipes can go a long ways let me tell you if you've got a pack of baby wipes, you are good. You can give yourself a little cat bath every five days, and you don't got to worry about nothing. You won't stink. Well, you'll probably stink a little bit. Depends how many baby wipes you use. Oh, I probably should not have shared that, should I have? Yikes. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, 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 okay. I see. I see. It's time. It's time. Yeah. You're blowing my mind, man. Mind-blowing moment of the day. So today's mind-blowing moment of the day, I'm going to go ahead and say it's when John L. Stedman told us about him practicing magic and actually visiting other realms. I think that's super interesting and super Doctor Strange-ish. I think it's awesome that he was a fan of the Doctor Strange comics when he was younger. I'm going to go with that. I think that's the most mind-blowing thing that that's even possible. And and I'm going to I'm going to add an amendment to that and say that it's also very interesting that you could actually use magic to communicate and connect with a being like Cthulhu. You're not going to catch me doing that anytime soon, but that's pretty damn interesting. That's pretty damn mind-blowing. And in fact, if you actually did that, I'm sure that your mind would become so blown that Hell, you might you might even have to go to that island and and find Cthulhu himself. They say he's going to return when the stars align, you know. Oh, I'm so so hyped about that video game. I hope it's good. It's going to be on PS4. I know for sure. I don't know if it's going to be on PC or Xbox uh, Xbox One or any of those other new systems, but I'm excited for it. Some of you older listeners probably aren't super into video games, but some of you are. Some of you older folk, you, you love video games, you know how to use use them and all that. So, again, you can't be too judgmental about that. And there's young people that aren't into it at all. But I think that 
an HP Lovecraft game, if done right, has a lot of potential. One of the coolest things that I've seen was a video on YouTube where it was a black and white Call of Cthulhu movie. You could probably find it. They do it like kind of like an old silent movie, and that's that's the best that I've seen. And hey, that's pretty much it for today. I do want to thank you guys for joining me. And our next show is going to be with Matthew Alford on September 3rd at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I do have some different stuff I'm doing. I'm kind of in a weird place right now where I have to get some other stuff done before I book any more shows. So there might be a... I don't think there's going to be shows between now and September 3rd. But as soon as we get to that show on September 3rd, uh, I'm going to start kicking it up again and scheduling a lot of shows. So that's kind of how this show works, as you may have noticed. We'll take little breaks, and then we'll I'll do a big bunch of shows, and then I'll kind of crawl back in my hole for, <laughs> for a little while, and then I'll, I'll come back out and do more shows. It's just the way it is because, like I said, I don't make money off of this, and that's kind of how I have to do it to make it work and keep keep everything going. It's like a big machine. So I'll disappear for a little while and get certain things done, and then I'll come back. But I'll always be here. Don't think because it's been a couple weeks and there hasn't been a show that I'm quitting or anything like that. It just means I'm on hiatus like everybody. And just be glad that uh, I'm not one of these people that starts podcasting and then just gives up on it. <laughs> like most most podcasts, they, they get off to a great start and then they lose interest. Their partner quits on them or, you know, something like that happens. And, and more and more I've noticed that there's a lot of disputes between people and their co-hosts and stuff like that. I, I really think that um, I really think that unless you're actually working for a radio station and everybody's getting paid, I think it's probably best to just do a, do your own show. And if you if you do want to team up with somebody else and do a show with them, just always have it in the in your mind and in their mind that if things you know if you ever feel like it's not fulfilling as it should be. You can always just go in your own directions and start your own shows like like Michael and I did. And, you know, now everything's great. We're both having way more fun at it. So uh, keep that in mind. Learn from my mistakes so you don't have to make those same mistakes over. That's what I try to tell people, you know, when I'm giving out my shitty advice is, hey, I, I actually went through this before. I made these mistakes and you can avoid them by just listening to what I have to say. And you can have a running start and not have to waste time making those same mistakes. And that, that applies all across the board. It, always learn from people. And, and try, to, try to learn the smart way and do things the smart way rather than having to make those mistakes yourself. Ask your parents. Ask people in, in the workplace to know what they're doing. Learn from the people that know what they're doing. Don't ever try to learn from people that don't know what they're doing because sometimes those people will be the first to give you advice. Look for the people that know what they're doing and learn from them. And, you know, what What you're going to find is that not everybody is as competitive and secretive as you might think. That there's people out there that understand that the future matters. And the only way we're going to have a good future is if we have if we have warriors out there that are out there fighting and spreading knowledge and information and actually working to make the world a little bit less of a shitty, selfish place. So shout out to all of you podcasters and YouTubers and and artists and, and musicians and all of you people out there with your various projects that you're starting up. I just want to give you all the encouragement in the world and big thank you to all those listeners out there. Oh my God, you guys really keep my wheels moving. You, It's you guys. It really is. It's you guys. It's the people that listen to this show every episode and wait for the next episode and really love and enjoy this program. That's why I'm here. I'm doing it 100%. Well, I suppose I enjoy it too, but I'm doing it 99% for you guys. That's why I'm doing it. So, so keep that in mind and let that be known. And until next time, this is the end of days, and I'm Daniel.
winter is coming. <laughs> The king has returned from the broken ruins of Babylon. This is the end of days. 